Somebody might come in here. You better podcast me fast. Two lines in this film are in the trailer. Uh Uh-huh. And when I was watching this film, which I had not seen in 20 plus years. But you did see it when it came out. I saw it when it came out. Okay. But I hadn't, I didn't, you know. Yeah. But then there were two lines that when they had, and they're both early in the movie. Yeah. I was like, I must have seen the trailer for this film like 50,000 times. I was going to say, I feel like this was a big rotation trailer. I remember seeing the trailer a ton of times. I, I remember mostly for, thinking. Like on demand yes, rentals, yep. like post theater, right. right? Like, you know, but it's, do you want to guess the two lines or do you want me to tell you? I want you to tell me. The first is Keanu Reeves saying, you mess with the devil, you, you could get burned, right? Uh-huh. You know, that one. Sure. The second one, which is the really important one, is Katie Holmes saying, "What's the matter? See something bad?" Yeah, that one. Yeah, which and then like in the trailer it goes like, you know, or like you know, some. But like, I must have just seen the trailer for this film forty billion times. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is just one of those trailers where you're just kind of like, huh, that movie that I'll never see that just exists as a trailer in my mind. And I remember the only thing that made me even consider seeing the movie at the time is like. This guy's directing Spider-Man next. Like it was right. the movie coming out after he was announced to direct it. And I think instead I just went, I'll watch the Evil Dead movies I, on video. I saw that it. was a timeline like, that it yeah. was it was like a package deal of like this movie's coming out and the announcement of they he hired gets him hired. Yeah. post filming on this movie. Mid production. Right. Pretty much while he's making this yeah. movie and wow. paid to delay post production on yes. this film so he could get started on Spider-Man. And I think the the research shows like and he's been candid, like he wasn't that involved in the post production or as involved in the post production no. of this movie. So his no. head was in a like, very his different head was in place. Spider-Man. Wow. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Like already. But that was the thing. Like they wanted him so badly and they wanted the movie to go so fast. And Spider-Man ended up getting pushed back. So it the timeline was not as stressed as they originally thought. But they were like, We will pay you Paramount a million dollars which is one-tenth of the budget of this movie, essentially. Like, we'll pay you a million dollars to push your movie back nine months and let Sam Raimi work on Spider-Man and just edit very slowly. Wow. And it's, yeah, like his composer on this was Christopher Young, who's Mm -hmm. kind of his backup guy when he doesn't work with Elfman, who did Spider-Man 3. Yeah. And Christopher Young was like, yeah, we like met once. Yeah. And he was just sort of like, I trust you. And Christopher Young was like an Elfman protege. And it was like, you know, he was, he just handed things off to his people a little bit. But yes, this movie came out and it was like, this is the last pre Spider Man movie of Sam Raimi. And it also had that weird vibe. I mean, this career arc we've been talking about, where it's like, he starts out in genre movies. Then he has this weird dip into like adult respectability. Yeah. And then he comes out into Spider Man. It's like you've now graduated into the but highest this is level of genre movie. Because this is a genre movie. It's in between. Right. So this is, I saw it as a young Oscar watcher because I was like Kate Blanchett leading role, uh, Oscar potential. And that you is and why I saw we've it. talked about this before. We had a huge fight in an episode about you being such uh, an Oscar watch forum. Cool kid, too. Fiend. Very cool. Right, so just wanted cool. to get that in. As well. And how the the narrative at the time was that Kate was fucking up. That Kate, it, it was it was that she was like uh, below Kidman, more, sure, more. I feel like there's another Winslet. Winslet was always in that weird territory where it's like she's an Oscar star, but is she a movie star? Yeah, right. Like, but like, but she's, sure, a, Winslet, she's a movie star, absolutely. But I more mean like she Winslet would do a lot of stuff. Like right. she would do art movies, she would do supporting roles, she would kind of bounce around because yeah. she'd already done Titanic. Right, but t- but Titanic solidified the movie star forever, so that I feel like her mantle could never be. T- no, she I was agree doing with you, great. but she it does feel like she if was you, just if you look at she years could take right after risks. Titanic, yeah. it feels like she's pointedly swerving as far away from Titanic as she can. And it's almost not until... Because it's, like, it's like Quills, right. Enigma, right. Iris. These are all supporting roles and sort of, you know... But, Eternal Arty, Sunshine Tony. kind of feels like the time where she re-grabs the gauntlet and goes, like, I'm a leading lady. Yeah. And it's, similarly, it's, it's that same year, right? Where it feels like Blanchett in between Elizabeth or, let's say, Tom to Mr. Ripley, no, Elizabeth, right? Elizabeth is certainly... The, in between Elizabeth and 2004, and 2004 is... The Aviator and, and also, the Life Aquatic, which she's wonderful in. Yes. Um, in between those two movies... She's kind of fucking up. Her only hits are these this series of films about like a lord of rings. 
Right. You know, like she mm. is in those. Right. Uh, and she's good in them. But that almost But I'm going to read you like, her project. Yes. It's like, is she doomed to just be the lady who's giving a little bit of gravitas in one scene per Lord of the Rings movie? Is she doomed to only be ethereal? Right. 100%. And it was also like, she is incredible in Elizabeth. That was the other thing. I was a big fan of that movie as a, a young English royalty nerd sure. <laughs> or whatever I was whatever kind a little of horrible confused, creature I was confused <laughs> but we'll let you go on Ben and I are looking at each other scans we're tilting our heads okay like a Gary um, Marshall dog reaction like Elizabeth shot. have you seen Elizabeth I'm, you know I never have I believe that because yeah. I feel like it was one of those movies where people are like this isn't actually that good it's not never actually will either probably that good but it is it's certainly better than Elizabeth the Golden Age yeah. it's a uh, you know it's begotten sequel but uh it is funny though I think it's mostly like powerhouse acting stuff when you know, that like, movie came out I think I assumed Kate Blanchett is someone who's been bubbling for a while and this is her breakthrough movie where in reality it's like she pretty much came out of nowhere with that she movie. had been in Oscar and Lucinda which was not right. a movie that went and then before, the before that she was like an Australian actress right. of no renown but yeah. there, there are few instances in the modern era of like a unknown actress getting the lead role in a movie like that and not only it being like a big Oscar player, she's nominated for the Oscar, all that sort of shit. Mm -hmm. But everyone being like, "Well, this is Meryl Streep. This will be a huge, exactly a huge. We're calling it prestige yeah. actress. She not, is not, clearly decades know, of. She's right. not going to be an action movie. She's going to be like you say, a Meryl Streep type who plays right. real life people, right, or whatever. Right. But it was like, just you know, like immediate anointment from that one movie. Yeah. Well, yeah. she has the quality. When I was watching this movie, I was I was like. Even before looking up her filmography, I was just like, where does this fall? This could have been her first movie. Everything about this is what I the minute she you. starts, she has a quality of you've already felt like she's not only could be the Meryl Streep, but she's already been the Meryl Streep in your life. It It's weird. It feels like, right. You're like, uh, did I miss the 10 years before this yeah, where she's been around and she's been developing? Because she just kind of arrived ready-made. Yes. A little bit. And, and her energy on screen is not just like, oh, this person's a confident performer, but it's like, you've been, we've loved you for 20 years, yeah. right? Like an erased memory of right. when she first entered our lives. So post-Elizabeth. Yes. It's a lot of supporting roles mm -hmm. in which she's good and a lot of lead projects that don't really work. That, that just don't exist. Uh, so uh, Pushing Tin, kind of a classic, huh, everyone in this is famous, no one seems to care. Okay, so it's Blanchett, uh, Joe Lee, Billy mm -hmm. Bob. Yeah. Who's the other guy? Cusack? It's Mr. John Cusack, who, at quite a height for him. A weird quartet. And like, but that was one of those things where it's like, you say those four names, and yeah. I'm like, I'm interested in like, you know who's crazy? Air traffic controllers, and I'm like, right. oh, are okay, and it's, it's like, no, they're crazy. It's directed by Mike Newell. It is right. Yeah. You're like, who's gonna direct this wacky and like, American? And I've film. got a great title for you that's gonna pull people in. Pushing tin. Yeah. What does that mean? Oh, it's like slang for airplanes. Uh, you lost me. Right. Anyway, anyway, pushing tin. And and years later, it'll be a movie that you confuse with so many with like five other movies. It, it yes. sounds like it could be like a golf movie or something. And then you're like, oh, that's what I thought. Right. It sounded like a golf movie. <laughs> I think yeah. it mostly only exists because of Jolie and Billy Bob getting married. That's later. how they got together. And obviously, right. Billy Bob knows Kate Blanchett right. uh, when she's yes. now the star. She's essentially playing his mother in this movie. Yes. Is, yes. Uh, I just which think is that, interesting. I think Pushing Tin as a title would have completely evaporated from the collective Pushing consciousness. Tin. If not for three years of like E News saying, the couple, of course, met on the set of Pushing Tin. <laughs> um, so then she's in The Talented Miss Ripley, which she's extremely good in, Phenomenal. but everyone's good in that yes. movie. And she's probably got the smallest of yes. the main roles. Mm -hmm. But she is good and she's very glamorous. But she yeah. is the one you talk about the least when you talk she about is. because everyone is so Jude good. Jude Law, Matt yeah. Damon, yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow, Philip Seymour Hoffman. And they're like, oh yeah, Kate Blanche is good in that. You know, yeah. like, you know, but it's a it's a fifth. But when she's I, but maybe again, beating Red yeah. But again, when you watch weirdly, when I think of Tom Thomas Ripley, I'm like one. That's the first one. She that must have been her very first movie. When, that must have been it introducing like, Kate Blanchett. Exactly, and it was like several movies in. And it, see, it was a few I, movies in. When I watched it for the first time, maybe ten years ago, I was like, Kate Blanchett's in this. Like, this is a weirdly small part for her at this point in time. And then you realize, like, this is her third American movie. It's just so distortive that Elizabeth was so big, yeah, and yeah. that she was the queen in a movie that had like eight hugely established actors in her but, supporting who, cast. But who are all hot, exciting actors. Yeah. No one in that movie, obviously Gwyneth Paltrow already has an Oscar. Yeah. Damon has the screenwriting on Oscar. But like everyone in that movie is still like young and proving themselves. And yeah. I mean, that movie rules. Then she's in The Man Who Cried, The Forgotten Sally Potter, wow. Totoro, Depp, Ricci, 
vehicle, which I have seen, and it's Ooh, not good. Okay. Uh, this year, uh, th- that's the same year as The Gift, mm-hmm. which The Gift, I would say, is just one of those movies that becomes a footnote, not really, does you know, not a huge hit, but it's not hated. No. But is kind of just like, oh, yeah, remember that movie with, like, Katie Holmes nudity? And, I think, like, I think truly the we'll two talk about that. lasting like, obviously, legacies of this movie are Katie Holmes nudity and this is the last thing he makes before he this, makes Spider-Man. And then Sam Raimi, like, still, right, pre-blockbusters. Right. She's in Bandits, which she's good in and gets some award This was a thing attention. we fought over. But, yeah, she got she every got a precursor. SAG and a Golden Globe nomination for Bandits. But she's phenomenal in that. She's good in that. The movie's kind of all over the place i kind of like Bandit. but it's sort of likable right yeah, yeah. yeah and billy bob's great in that too she was in charlotte gray which yes. is a french resistance world war ii movie directed by jillian armstrong this is a classic Kate blanchett pre-oscar yes. project where you're right. like that sounds like something everyone's gonna go for and right. no one goes for nothing it. she's in the shipping news where she plays the crazy uh lady who leaves him i remember her being fun in she's that she's like a spark plug in it right. it's a kind of a horribly written role right but she's because she's like i'm crazy right. i'm going to cheat on you goodbye you know like it's sort of like but she is fun and that movie is so dour <sighs> otherwise turk card yeah great finger work david thank you i was doing a lot of finger work yeah uh good book have you ever read the shipping news no i was about to ask so it, it just, no I'm, i i we have not read it, but it sounds like a movie that I knew was made from a book. Yes. It's bad. Uh, it's definitely from the time when you when you were debating, I'm not going to see the movie yet because I'm going to read the book first, which well, does not happen It's now. an absolute, you see the poster, you see the cast, and you go, that's a book. That's yeah. a I know that's a book. book. I, I smell to, book all I don't even need one. to walk closer to see based on the book, <laughs> based on the acclaimed the novel. The book is also a you know, dour. It's about a dour dude. He's yeah. not a happy man, no. and he lives in Nova Scotia, and he writes for a newspaper that just tells you when boats are coming in. But and, in the book, that's you're also like, I like this mood. When you know? Spacey's like, people love it when I'm depressed and angry about my status. But in life. Spacey is like absolutely mind-bogglingly miscast. Them. Yes. He's one of the most insane. Like we read that book, Spacey's like the 80th person you think right. of, even though he's really famous. You know, he's just won yes. an Oscar, or whatever. Then she reunites with the gifts, Giovanni Rubisi. Yes, yeah. heaven. I, okay. Uh, uh, which was the you know the Krzysztof yeah. Kieślowski uh, yeah. script that he never made before he died. I always get Heaven and Enigma confused, but Enigma, Enigma was is, Winslet. Is Winslet? That's the uh, British Code Breakers in right. the '40s movie that is like totally watchable. Like, but is Rabisi in that as well? Why do I always get Enigma and Heaven confused? I mean, they came out at the same time. Yeah, he's not in it. It's you know one of your classic Do Gray Scott Saffron Burroughs Jeremy Northam vehicles. Okay. <laughs> That was a movie I saw with my mom, Enigma. And we were like, that was great. They they broke the codes, you know. Like So Enigma's more watchable than Heaven, but they both have Heaven's that vibe weird. of like Yeah. Heaven's what? Weird. Is it Heaven at all like Enigma? Uh, maybe in costuming, but like, he plays period, a Nazi pe- time era? Uh, well, Heaven I no. think is you know, it was this whole thing where Kishlowski post three colors, right. right? He died of I wanna say cancer he, he like he died in uh you know uh he died too young he was 54. he never got to make the fourth color which everyone was waiting for <laughs> no he had done his colors he never he, <laughs> he never, never had to he, make four. He, he never managed to, he never got to blend the colors right no he had done his colors red white and blue he did I'm just that. saying it might have been like a kill bill volume three thing where Purple. for 20 years no. people went like any chance you go back for a fourth color <laughs> he he had, like, i've been dabbling with green but i don't know if i'm gonna do post it. colors he had a new <laughs> trilogy he'd written okay. called heaven hell purgatory oh, oh. and they all he died before any of them were made okay uh and they're set i think in kind of well heaven is set i think in italy but in like fascist tickford directs heaven and tom tickford directed it okay and then i believe uh they did make hell dennis dennis tanovich remember him no the guy who made that no man's land movie okay uh and then purgatory was never made does Giovanni give That's a restrained performance as a Nazi? Uh, he's an Italian I mean, fascist. Yeah, I let's, I'm I mean, not sure. Like he famously restrained. Yeah, let's put a pin in sure. Rabisi we'll and, and how you can and cannot use Rabisi in a movie. That's a conversation we're going to have at length. So, all right. So at this point, Kate yeah. Blanchett, she's obviously the Lord of the Rings movies are doing great. Sure. She, but, you know, nothing's really working, right? 2003, brutal. Veronica Guerin and The Missing. Yeah. Two. Blanchett movies yeah. that the Oscars ignore, yeah. the people ignore, no yeah. one remembers. But they were both like, you know, presented I mean, yeah. as like yeah. award season. And then it was really like, fuck, Blanchett's like in trouble. And I would say her, her being in Lord of the Rings already 
the way I think of her in Lord of the Rings is almost is like more like an actress almost at the end of her career. Yes, like it's right. not Where you're like oh yeah, sure she was already like so she's established. with the yeah. the established British actors. That are in, rest in, in that film. The movie is sort of using her prestige on loan to help itself more than the movie is helping her. Yes. In that sense. Like, outside of visibility. And right? it's, and it's she's like... She's so well cast. She is. She's great But it's like, yeah. it's like... it's like it's already, like, jumped ahead 20... It's already assumed a level of prestige... Right. ...that you can't have established already... This it, early it's on. almost like she's doing like an elder statesman Helen Mirren thing where it's yes. like you're lending credibility to this film yeah. by you, Kate Blanchett, doing this. It's yeah. really weird when she but turns so into a ghoul. That part rules. Like, that so part good. rules, but so it's good. like weird to see her do that. It's so good. But it freaked is, me out when I was It is yeah, funny to be like too. Lord of the Rings. The first Lord of the Rings comes out three years after Elizabeth. Yes. Right, like, yeah. and I'm like, she's Ian McKellen. One like, year that, after the that, gift. That yeah, but no, of she's status. just at yeah. the start of her long road. Right. The thing with the it's Garen missing turvy. combo yeah. is that it's also like, you know, Garen, she's doing an Irish accent. She's playing a real person. Right. The missing is the other version. It's like D. Clam, period, yeah. Western. Tommy, like, Ron she, Howard, post-Oscar. Yeah, so she's like, she's coming at it from both angles and yeah. both angles, people are like, no, thank you. And then, of course, in 2004, she's so good in The Life Aquatic. Incredible. Maybe my yeah. favorite performance in that movie. She's so funny. Yeah. The scene where he makes her cry is so good. Yeah. Uh, and then, obviously, The Aviator is a good performance. Mm-hmm. It was almost annoying that she won the Oscar because it's just like, you know, you played Catherine Hepburn, sure. you did the voice. She is good. She is good. But it is funny. I remember going. It's a weird Oscar. I don't like, also, I, I, I never love when the Oscar goes to a impression. Me neither. I mean, it's, yeah. I, I never love a, yeah. Like her Bob Dylan performance. Is not an impression. Is not an impression and is much more interesting and probably would have won her. That's only three years later, right? right. You know, like. But at that point, she just won. It was game. too recent for yeah, her yeah, to yeah. win a second. I I remember seeing the theater with my mom. I guess maybe opening weekend, and her first scene on the golf course happens, and the audience at the end of the scene breaks into applause. And I turned to my mom. I was like, I guess she's winning the Oscar. Like it was one of those things where Golly, people were like, you know, yeah, yeah. But people, I mean, you know, fucking Tony New York audience opening weekend, Aviator limited she release, whatever. But like people were just fucking like, okay, you pulled it off. Like it, it, it really it felt was too that. risky to do. I actually want to see who she beat now. 2004? Uh, yeah. I never so saw... it would have been... You never saw The Aviator? Never saw The Aviator. Sophia... It's actually a great movie. Can I see if I can name the four? Yeah. Sophia Canedo for Hotel Rwanda. Yeah. A good performance. Virginia Madsen for Sideways. Yes. Who maybe I... should have won. I guess so. It's a good performance, and she'd won like all the Critics Awards. Right. But it always felt like she was never going to win the Oscar because she was Virginia Madsen. Yes. Mm-hmm. There was just that that ultimate limit where they were like, mm, nomination. You right. know what I mean? Like, Okay, so wait. You've been in too many Candyman movies. Is this supporting? Supporting actress. Supporting. She could have. Yes. You can be Virginia Madsen and win in supporting. No, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying the Oscars, I feel like, have that snobbiness with the like, you're not you're not a good actress in anything else. But even though she can be good. I you know. know what I, mean? I think like, they were like, you have to give two good performances exactly. in a row you're before we give you an Oscar. Right, you're right, not right. going to get this one out of nowhere. Um, and also they were right. She probably never gave a good performance again. <sighs> she's, You know, she's very good in her smell. Alex's movie, which she's very well cast. Yeah. I that's, just remember seeing that and she comes on as Elizabeth Moss's mother and I was like, that makes sense. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Um, but yes, no, she hasn't been used that well since Sideways. Uh, okay, wait. Uh, Akaneda. So you've named Akaneda Blanchett. So the one of them is a young uh, actor who is ha, has vaulted into oh, total oh, prestige. Oh, it's Natalie Portman Closer. Yes, Closer. who won the Golden Globe. Yes. And was a threat. Right, this was kind of a split field in a, in a weird way. Yeah. And then the fifth person is not in a Best Picture nominee, are they? No, the fifth person is a very good actress who had been on a great run at getting her first Oscar nomination for a fairly bland performance oh. in a biopic. In a biopic. As a wife. Huh. Yeah. I mean, there's President there's a reason a... you don't remember this. It's not it's not Laura Lenny and Kinsey. It is Laura Lenny and Kinsey. It's not her first nomination. Isn't you can it? count on me. Oh, right, obviously. What am I talking David, about? David, you her, fool. Yeah. Her second nomination. Yes. We, yeah, well, anyway, but, but, but she is good in that. She's totally good because she's Laura Linney. It's just surprising that I think that movie. You know what I'm confusing it with? It was Patricia Clarkson's first nomination. Pieces of, April. Pieces of April, where you were like, she's good in this. But she's been better in other things. That's why I got confused because it felt right. like you were describing Patricia right, Clarkson. Right, I right. knew that was two thousand. Of course, Lenny did have. Has Lenny not gotten a nomination since Savages? She's good in that. She's good in that. Yeah. I just thought Kinsey was very good, and it seemed like a major Oscar player. And then it like only got the Lenny nom, and you're like Neeson weirdly snubbed, screenplay snubbed. Um. Yeah, Neeson snub was weird. 
William Sorry. Sadler has one of the great one scene performances in history in that movie. I guess so. I don't remember that movie very well. The world's biggest sex freak. Yeah, I guess I remember that. Yeah. Right. I mean, Kinsey. Anyway, anyway, you know, once she wins the Oscar, the funny thing is she actually kind of muddles along for a few years after that because, like, she's in Babel, but who remembers that? Like, that she's it in it. It was such a big deal. It was a at big the movie. Time. Yeah. She's in The Good German, which is probably the worst Steven Soderbergh movie. It's, it's in the conversation. Mm hmm. Um, no, no time scandal. No time I think scandal. She's phenomenal. Awesome she's really good in yeah. that. I think, and that one—that's one of the ones that lingers the most. That's yeah. when it's a, suddenly it, like everyone is now just like she is Meryl Streep type. Yeah. Right. It's or so whatever. odd that it's that now we're at that because we were already we started at that and now we it took all this time to get back to that. Yes, because it was the initial how she began. And, and her, like yeah. it does make you realize how much Winslet was smart to be like. Let me not have the whole movie rest on my shoulders for yes. a couple of years. Let, let me, me wait let me until take, you know take some supporting roles. Right. Whereas take, all those yeah. things, the Blanchett movies that don't exist are all like Blanchett front and center, her face, or it's something like the shipping news where it's like it's a supporting part, but this is the part that's supposed to win her the Oscar. Like I remember so much of the buzz of that movie being like, she's got the wild part. Right, right. Well, I think I think Blanchett was trying. She was taking parts that she wanted to try so many different things. And that yeah. made her not think – Caitlin Winslet does not do that. Hmm. Like, I'm not saying she's not different in different films. Yeah. But I don't think she – I it, it, it just feels to be like a different kind of mania with Blanchett being like, now I'm going to show I'm funny. Now I'm going to show I'm the crazy sure. – in a, in a very condensed timeline. This is, I mean, just a fascinating thing for her to do so quickly, this movie. The Gift? Yeah. I mean, I think well, the, it was one of those yeah. things where this is her first leading role in an American film. Yeah. And I th I, I, I know this is going to sound silly, but like I think the Billy Bob Thornton script part of it is still a major hook. Then. Huge. I like, yeah. To, to me, there's no mystery why anyone is in this film. Like This film to me encapsulates exactly what actors thought the future of cinema was going to be. Sure. What they thought movie making was. And the fact that it's right before Spider-Man means everyone – predicted the future wrong yeah but the way i when you watch the interviews of the actors talking about this film the way they they're so solemn keanu reeves talking about he got like therapists coaching him and trauma everyone discusses it as though it is a much more serious work than it is because it, and it's and it's right at it, we it yeah. really is about everything's about to change with everything sam raimi yeah and so every one of them read this script and thought it was a, an incredible script they thought it was saying something very important they thought it was about trauma it was about yeah. abuse it was showing a part of america that you don't see like i right. Right. i'm i've never been less confused why every actor in this film is is in a, is in a film it's funny because the cast is so stacked and then you realize there must have been this feeling around the movie where it's like this is like a few good men. Like it's better to have a small part in the gift yes. than be a lead in something else. The high tide is going to raise all ships and you have bit. multiple different people at different career points all using this movie to be like, this is the exact kind of movie you want to be a part of. Yes. Katie Holmes wants to transcend being teen star. Hilary Swank is trying to like keep the momentum going off of her Oscar win. This is Keanu right after The Matrix. Yeah, he wants to show that he can be a bad guy. Right. Greg Kinnear, similarly, like, I want to be, like, a little heavier. I I've feel done yeah. light comedy. Almost right. everyone in this movie is like, can I do something I have a thing outside to of my... Yeah, my and, there's a real, and there's a real innocence, too. Like, that's too. a Katie Holmes, Giovanni... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah, there's yeah, yeah, an yeah. innocence with just what they thought movies were. Like, I just... Yeah. It is really... I'm telling you when, you, when I watch people talk about it, it just feels so pure how they were like, we're taking this very seriously. We st we very much believe in filmmaking. We very much believe in the message of this. And just knowing that no one, that they don't know what's coming. Yes. Not, not no one involved in this. It adds like a poignancy to it that, um, that I think this film would not have had if things Griff, hadn't changed. Did you introduce the podcast? No, I haven't. No, you haven't. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay, we just sorry. got so deep in the we good did, I mean, I just like the Blanchett. I love. To I do think too. About that. You dove right in. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I can't help myself. I mean, you, we can wait till the end more, of the show. Right? I mean, we don't. No, no, no I, 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 I don't look. I want to say this is a podcast called Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin, and I'm David. D D Ben's disappointed. Them. Ben's looking at me with disappointment. No, it's okay. That I didn't hold off on introducing until the end. No, but you've already done that before. You can't do that. That's my point. Thank this you. This is also no biz podcast. Yeah, so. but I mean, I'm sorry. What was yeah. I thinking? Sorry. You can't just throw that in. There was a point. 
you've done when you did it before there was a reason for it was it. funny you, it was it yeah. was different yeah it was thematic it fit in with right. the episode you can't just like suddenly just willy-nilly be you doing can't, that you can't do it you yeah. can't do it and ben also i'm a contrarian so you said you could wait to introduce it to the end i was like fuck you i'm introducing it right now i wouldn't have let it happen though because I, I i just think it can't be repeated unless it has a reason fair enough all right everything I'm glad we hashed it out on mic everything happens for a reason look it's a podcast about filmographies and hashing out arguments on mic right Directors who have massive success early on in their careers. Wait, are we fighting now? No, I think we're good, right? Okay, yeah. David. Yes. Sometimes a gift can be a curse. Uh, sometimes a gift can be a curse. Yeah. Sometimes, like in Sam Raimi's movie, The Gift, her gift for seeing her all C and I can be a little bit of a curse. It gets her into some trouble. That's true. But here's the thing that people don't talk about that much. Sometimes a gift could be a gift. Okay. Right? No one talks about this. Sometimes someone gives you a gift, and it's a real gift. It's not a curse. The, yeah, they, they've gifted you something. It's a gift. I, 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 I'm confused. You're confused? Look, David, Shopify is sponsoring this episode, right? That's true, but you, you got to make the noise. Well, you usually make the noise. Ka-ching! Oh, sorry. Right. Should I have made the noise? Ka-ching! No, it's fine. Well, okay, see, you're just better at it. I think you're better at it. I feel like that's that's the sound of a real gift. David, this is the point, okay? You can set up a store on Shopify and sell gifts for people to buy, to give to other people, but you are also receiving the gift of another sale. Ka-ching! Ka-ching! Look, maybe it's a little sweaty. Maybe my journey to this ad read, it's been a little bit of a circuitous walk. Your journey to this ad read, Griffin, not to call you out, is your journey yeah. to a lot of ad reads, which is you tried to think of the name of the movie we were covering, and you were like, how can I squeeze this one in? How can I get this ship in a bottle? Look, the point is that Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big businesses. So upstart startups and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online, in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Big businesses like, I don't know, whatever Katie Holmes' dad does in the gift versus small businesses like Kate Blanchett doing tarot card readings out of her home in the gift. I don't know. Yeah, you think you think she had a Shopify? Ching! <laughs> That's another reading. <laughs> Look, scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility, David. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, this podcast uses Shopify to sell merch. Spatulas spatulas to sell uh what's another silly thing that we sell uh coins uh, comedy point coins yes chip coins yeah. chip coins uh and we're not stopping there success griffin it's a forever evolving path right yes so uh you know we're going to use shopify for all kinds of fun uh business stuff in the future i i just love how it has the tools and resources that make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe and i also want to make it clear that when i said that we sell bitcoins i mean bit space coins coins that are bits yep that's right the coin is a bit pretty much everything we do is a bit even though we're no bit podcast of course shopify griff you might know this they've got mm -hmm. all these channel integrations facebook instagram tiktok pinterest so you can synchronize online and in-person sales you get some conversion rates profit margins it's more than a store shopify grows with you and this is possibility incarnate powered by shopify david yep i got a gift for our listeners cha-ching you go to shopify.com slash check all lowercase for a free 14-day trial and get full access to shopify's entire suite of features you grow your business with shopify today go to shopify.com slash check right now shopify.com slash check ka-ching ka-ching this is blank check with griffin and david I'm it griffin. is i'm david it's a podcast about filmographies directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want and sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce baby yes this is a mini series on the films of sam raimi it's called Podcast Me to Hell. Today we are talking about his 2000 supernatural prestige thriller drama, The Gift. Southern Gothic supernatural thriller. So many weird things going on with this movie. I think <laughs> our guest, Starly Kine. Hi. The great Starly Kine returning to the show. I think this is kind of the, my genre on this show. I was right? going to say. 
once we picked Raimi, we were like, oh, we should ask Darlie to do that again, yeah. right? Like, it just felt like in both of these cases, as with What Lies Beneath, I was like, Charlie would be a good person to have on for like a, a 2000 <laughs> adult sexual supernatural <laughs> prestige thriller made by a serious director. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I really enjoy watching these kind of movies. It, uh, I told you that when I first came on. I, these movies are the same year. They are the same. I mean, there's a, it's well, the I exact mean, I, same vibe going because on. I, right. I mean, that makes sense. And what I, another thing I find interesting about that is that the actors are still taking these movies seriously, but yes. neither of those movies are, were big hits with the critics or even sure. like, um, with the box office. So it's well, like, no, what lies beneath was a huge hit at oh. the box office. That's what's interesting. But the is, critics panned that correct. and they, they were mixed to me. Well, both, yeah, yeah. Well, both what lies beneath and this one yeah. in the reviews, they say, much like Kate Blanchett, you don't know where she's falling. Her like she mm -hmm. arrived at the the biggest star in the world before she even become a star. I'm always surprised that this year the stuff that we are like, oh, I've seen that a million times, had already been done a million times. Yes, both the reviews of what Life Beneath and and The Gift are the critics are like. It's just a bunch of scares it's that we've seen. Shit. Yeah, it's this shit again. And then, but some of the actors are like, this is so new, and the filmmakers like they're behind what has I've, been out in the world. I think Southern Gothic movies. Were, cons were were had had a bit of a run uh -huh. because post Sling Blade, sure, you got Eve's Bayou, you got Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Uh -huh. You know, you, you have a few kind of prestige murdery sure. Southern. Well, I don't know. I'm fanning myself. You know, like right. a lot of that. And maybe by the time the gift is coming up, people are kind of like, okay, we get but it. It's more Everyone's the doing an accent. Sure, you know, you know. I, I but do. The, the scary scared. stuff is yeah. what every, is what every the critics are like. What. We're not, you're not, we're not scared of this. We There's like, coming. right. There's like six months, right. Where between what, what lies beneath coming out in like the middle of July and being this huge fucking hit, the critics are like, okay, jerk off motion. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then this comes out like qualifying run December for Oscars and then really comes out in January. And what lies beneath is like a fucking whatever, $90 million movie with the biggest movie star in the mm -hmm. world and like yeah. a huge leading actress and the biggest director and whatever. And it's a big fucking hit. No one takes it seriously. It's not even whispered about for Oscars or anything. And then this is released six months later as like Paramount doesn't even know what to do with this. It's released by you know, it's Paramount, Paramount Classics, Classics, which is their awards arm. Which are like, this doesn't feel like a Paramount Classics movie, but Paramount's like, this is a little too small for us to know what to do with. It's stacked with movie stars they were like this is an oscar play the oscars are like this might be a little too genre -y it's for us. stacked with names i would say keanu's the only movie star in it uh-huh it's you stacked know, with like, names. it's stacked with you know like right. swank has just won an oscar but obviously yes. it's still pretty new blanchett yes. right she's still pretty new yeah rabisi where's well i guess we'll just well, have right, a right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and katie holmes obviously it's that thing of like hey the kid from tv and like right. crappy teen movies right. is trying to be in a grown-up movie like, god it was but billy bob is also her. billy bob's yeah. also a name billy bob is a name like, although weirdly is not on any of the advertising like you'd think they might say like from the writer of Sling Blade or whatever yeah. but it's the advertising is very much just Kate Blanchett going you know like big big Kate Blanchett face names yeah and then a lot of like the only witness to the crime wasn't even there you right. know like a lot, a lot of crimey murder mystery there's an A24 version of this movie now right that gets like bought at Sundance and A24 cuts together a trailer that makes it look scarier than it is and they release it wide and they somehow trick people into making like 20 million dollars uh, but but it's artsier than this, but whereas this movie is like made by a studio who insists on releasing it through their specialty arm. But the film is like surprisingly kind of I don't say broad in a negative way, but it's not like like he's trying to make an accessible movie. But he can't I help think, But I think right. the actors and to some extent, Sam Raimi think this is an 824 movie. I, I think it's that's in an odd in between zone. But it's because but when you hear Sam Raimi talk about the punishing of the audience and this he comes yeah. back to talking about that again. Like the the Bruce Campbell quote about he wants to punish the audience. Yes. Which I feel like is Sam Raimi's driving force yeah. as a filmmaker. He talks about it when in interviews about this. The darkness of this movie is why he was worried that the studio was going to he, he was, I think he was really drawn to how dark the Giovanni Ribisi darkness and the not just not the well, scary stuff, but the yeah, actual yeah, like, like the, the, the intensity of the stuff. content. And yeah, I yeah, think, yeah, yeah. and I think that in his mind is a 24. JJ pulled up our researcher yeah. in the dossier, this interview with him where he says when he read the script for the first, I mean, do you want to read the quote directly? Yeah. Yeah. But let's, let's, 
let's sure. let's back up let's and back start up. with some context. This is an early Thornton script. Tom mm-hmm. Epperson, the co-writer, is his buddy. Right. They wrote one false move together. After Billy Wilder tells him at a party, you should write scripts. Yeah, he's like a caterator or whatever. Yes. And he's like, Billy Wilder, I love your work. And he's like, you should write your own movies. Yeah. You're, you're so he, he and Epperson write like a handful he of scripts together. He told Billy together. Bob that? Or he told Billy Bob okay. that. Billy Bob. They write a handful of scripts together. And then one false move is obviously the thing that gets them off the ground. But there yeah. were a couple of scripts that they sold that never got made before that. Uh, yeah, a family thing, which eventually right. became an MGM movie. I don't know it. It's uh, I looked this up last night. It's well, two big actors. That's pretty cool. Uh, it's Robert Duvall and James Earl Jones. Thank you. Love that. And then Sling Blade's the third one, but yeah. Gift was in that pile of like the other scripts they had written around this time that just only got bought up once they were hot. Post right. Sling Blade, the yeah. plan is for Thornton to direct this movie, yeah. which seems very logical, uh-huh. especially since it's about his mother. Mm-hmm. It's a very personal project for him. Jodie Foster is going to play the leading role. Mm-hmm. Slam dunk. Slam dunk. I'm just like... I, and I like this movie okay, but I like, like it okay. I, you know, but like I'm like I'll see that. Yeah, and no offense to Raimi, but I kind of want Thornton to direct the movie. I do yeah. too. I mean, it is. I will say that like all the quotes of like you don't understand how much this is about my mother, and Billy Bob Thornton saying that when he worked with Blanchett again on because they work on Pushing Tin, right. this movie gets made, and then they work together on Bandits. Yeah. Right. And he's like, you're my, right. And when they're making bandits, she has played his mom. And he's like, this is weird. You're my mom now. Right, right, right. And it, you do feel like there's some personal element missing from this movie that Thornton probably would have brought. Mm-hmm. I think so. I mean, it's sort of yes. what makes Sling Blade work, right? right? I mean, I haven't seen Sling Blade in a billion years. But like, that's sort of some like. Some call it a Sling Blade, yeah. Yeah, I mean, French fried potatoes. But I mean, some, you know, that's sort of like, you know. He he gets this world. He gets right? right. Like that was what people was appealing about Sling Blade part. Like, right. right. Like this feels realistic. I don't know. Anyway. A, and I think I, it was the French think, fried potatas. Yeah. I think he honest. might have been able to potatoes. something that bothered me about this film was that her being a psychic did not ever matter. Like every time she, she keeps seeing what's gonna happen and then never stops it from happening. And that's her... She isn't objectively... She's a bad crime-fighting psychic. Yes. She's an okay psychic. She, no, she's a great... <laughs> right, I would say right, arguably right. a great psychic, right. bad crime-fighting fight, psychic. So maybe if Billy Bob was channeling his mom more, it would have leaned more just on her... She, he would have just cracked the nut of the psychic because she just... I know that she feels the guilt about not telling her husband not to go to the mill or whatever during the explosion, but then she never remedies that. <laughs> Every yes. time she predicts something, she does not. It, and it it's is, not a message. It doesn't seem to be saying you can't stop things from playing out. It just seems to be that she's not doing the thing she's supposed she to do. She did intervene, though. She did, in the movie, say that she tried to stop him that morning because sure. she had had a dream. Yeah. So I do think that she tries, but it's like, at least my take was the world is not accepting of what she but has to say. When it comes to, to even her own, her being in danger, she sees stuff that's going to happen right. and doesn't correct her own, alter the course for it not to happen, which you would think would be the advantage of having psychic powers. It is just weird. I I think that, I think this movie is okay. I think Blanchett's performance is solid, but her, something about her character just doesn't totally work. It yes. doesn't totally make sense. And when you read the quotes from Billy Bob Thornton talking about his own childhood experience and what he's drawing from, you're like, there's a specificity there yeah. that is interesting to build a fictionalized movie around, that type yeah. of person in this type of setting, that dynamic, that this movie somehow never captures. Yeah. I agree with everything It needed to be written saying. by a son. It's, this movie feels too small in a certain way. Like, it's one of those sort of murder mystery problems where you're like, I kind of know what this is, where this is going, because it's got, got seven characters. you got your six characters. faces on the poster, yeah, and I you know. immediately go, like, well, he's the red herring. Yeah, Keanu is obviously the red herring, and then we're, like, pretty much, Katie Holmes is the murder victim, right. Kate Blanche is the You're psychic. You're like, like, too obvious, so he has to be serving some other function. Yeah, spoiler I, alert, it's so I do thing. like, though, that the, I do think it's interesting to have the red herring be revealed that there's a whole other hour that follows. Yeah, yeah. the like, red herring stuff Keanu happens getting very con- fast. Keanu yeah. getting convicted an hour in and then another whole hour passing. Yeah. There's yeah. something, normally that is reserved for the last 10 minutes. So there's something structurally interesting about that to me, even if it kind of plays out in a predictable way. Yeah, and look, I think the movie probably works better if the Buddy Cole stuff is, I don't know. Yeah. The, the, what you're talking about, Starly, the like torturing the audience thing. Yes. All the Raimi quotes, there's this one, I'm sorry, I'm like jumping ahead to, 
But he said when he read the script, like he like put it down halfway through. He yeah. got about halfway through it, and he said, "This is too intense and depressing for me." And then he's like, "Why am I running from this?" Now, I guess it's, it's obviously the joke is like the guy who made the Evil Dead thought this was too, but right. it's like, but obviously when he made his horror films, he couched it in fantasy and silliness, right? And this is a movie. You know about abuse and yeah, you know, that's what he's mundane, referring to, right? Yeah, like the, he's mostly talking, I think, about the the child abuse. Yes, the buddy Cole stuff. Of the, yeah, of the backstory. Yeah, because it seemed like when this movie came out, people were like, "Oh, Sam Raimi was drawn to this movie because it's an it's a haunted house movie, right?" And he's getting back to his roots, sure. and this is what he wants to do. He's combining and also, the two halves: it's prestige Sam Raimi with the earlier genre Sam Raimi, and he's yeah. working with top tier actors and whatever. Yeah, but when he talks about it, it sounds like he's like, "Yeah, there's a haunted house. I sure I have to do that." But like his all of his heart is in the prestige and the he drama wants, of as it. He puts not, I think all the haunted house stuff works great. It does. But well, he seems like that's what he cared about. Lee. I, mean, I know. He's, I know. He's, he's, he's yeah. saying that's not why I did. I want to be clear here. Right. This is not. I'm not. Uh, that was in, not the pull for me. In I the know. gift, he wanted to present the supernatural as something that really existed. That uh -huh. was real. This is what he's saying. Yeah. Versus the Evil Dead where he's like, I wanted the actors to draw the audience. And everything he's, you know, all my technique I yeah. threw out the window. All my camera stuff. I wanted to create a real world. And it is one of those things that we've been talking about in this middle of Raimi's career where he keeps saying this. And I think it's successful in a simple plan. Yes. Uh, and I think it's sort of semi too unsuccessful for the this and the baseball movie. Agreed. And but it, it's like he seems so intent on being like I'm not the Sam Raimi you think I am. Right. And then with Spider Man he's like, what if I tried being the Sam Raimi you think I am the again? Most, and it's well, like, oh, this is triumphant. It is so <laughs> odd because in the arc of his career versus all these careers we see now, where someone makes like a really good personal small movie and then they get hired to make a humongous fucking Marvel movie. And then it's like, I guess this is means to an end that now they have the cachet to make whatever they want, but they maybe get stuck in this semi-anonymous blockbuster realm where 20% of their voice is coming through on any movie. And instead it feels like Raimi was kind of stuck in his own making these like programmed studio dramas with good movie scripts, stars. I guess. Oh, right. right. Good with stars a, with, a star. with big stars. Right. And then it's yeah. like his personality was a little lost in it. And then he gets to make Spider-Man and you're like, this is the purest reflection of this mm. man's yeah. sensibility. Like this is so personal and handmade. But that's why I think it, but I think when you read about Sam Raimi, how he makes decisions, he always has a reason for why he took a movie. Else. Yes. And I think Sam Raimi's a filmmaker who struggles with who he actually is. He is he, Spider Man is what he should be doing, and it is him fully realized. And and the, these movies that lead up to it are him being like, "I wish I was this other kind of filmmaker." Because he also has that quote about like he was making movies that he thought he was supposed to make, not only to sell, but like using the magic of filmmaking, yes. right? And he's like, why don't I just then make movies that I, I want to watch? And it's and that's not Spider-Man. That's this movie. I know. That's he's applying so it to this. So he wants to be yeah. Billy Bob, I think. And even like in the earliest pieces of research we have from our, our early episodes in this series, they talk about like Tappert and Campbell and everybody yeah. that like, Sam wasn't a guy who like loved horror movies. It yeah. was like a strategic decision of like, this is what can sell. This is a good way to show off my skills as a director or whatever. But like when we were kids and made short films, he wanted to make like dramas yeah. and like political thrillers or whatever. And so it is this odd thing where you're like, this guy's so fucking good at what he does. When and he then, excels at. Like right. He's, yeah. And then he sort of treats it like, yeah, I'm like having fun. These are like fun larks. These are kind of movies I liked when I was a child. But obviously I'm an adult now. I'd like to make adult movies. The quotes for this movie are all like, I've grown up, I'm married, I have kids. These are the movies I want to watch. I want to make these kinds of movies. Yeah. And then he, he gets that little spark of like, fuck, what if I could direct Spider-Man? When it feels like he has put all that shit in a box and, and put right. it in and a then, But he closet. has this sort of like, actually put me in, put my name in the hat. Put my there. name in the hat. And then he makes right. it. And every, like, I mean, just we'll jumping ahead, but all those fucking Spider-Man interviews I was watching, every cast member is like, when you talk to him about this movie, his eyes are like glowing. Like he is the most excited I've it's ever seen any it. director. It's be. why he gets that job because but, he's so well. But we'll that's what's so he's interesting. Like the, the his journey to feel peace about that because that's he's not at peace in these middle no. movies. He is thinking that this is what he's not only it's not just what he's supposed to be doing it's not just that he thinks he's supposed to make a movie it's what he he's telling himself this is what he wants to be doing right. and this is what he wants to be watching and there's a darkness that Sam Raimi gravitates to from the from evil because evil dead not only is it very scary it is 
dark. Like yeah. the he's he's got dark stuff inside him. And I think he's very drawn to that. I think it's why the gift in the disturbing parts of the gift, it's really disturbing. And I think that's what he's like kind of the most excited about. Uh, he's the worst at it. I know. He's not good at it. But no. that's but that's the I lack mean, of peace. But his, It feels cartoony, he, all of it. Yeah, and exactly. and then whenever he does the haunted house stuff, you're like, this has some fucking energy to but it. But he's like the filmmaker who wants to be the novelist or something. Like sure. he wants to be he for some reason convinced himself that he had to be this other kind of filmmaker. And again, he also predicts it wrong. No one knows that Spider Man's no. about but to this change. But in the nineties, every- that makes sense that he feels that way. Yes. He's like Soderbergh, you know, Sundance, like all right. these, like, you know, yes, I should be like them, right? And also, I can who, see that. I don't like the think biggest it, movie yeah. stars in the 90s, right? It's like, it's Tom Cruise and Harrison Ford, and their big movies are like this. Yeah. I'm not yeah. saying this specifically, no, but they're no, like but, taking good scripts with directors off a shelf, stacking a supporting cast, mm-hmm. and they're making like adult dramas that maybe have a slight genre element. Well, to like, them. what if there was a firm? What if there was a firm? You know, you buy a hit novel, whatever the fuck it is. What like, if there was. A Jerry Maguire. The Will Smith takeover has just right, started right. happening at the yeah. end of the 90s. Where it's like, I am the star. Right. Everything is about my persona as a star. That's different. Right. The thing is, though, this is a small budget movie. Yes. You know, for the this is a this this cost half as much as a simple plan, which is a fairly yeah. muted small movie. Right. And it cost mm-hmm. a fifth or a sixth as much as for Love of the Game. Uh, correct. For, yeah. Love of the Game cost fifty million dollars. This cost nine. Yeah. Um, it was obviously distributed by Paramount Classics because mm-hmm. of, in Raimi's opinion, the you know the extreme content, you know, child molestation, yeah. patricide. This idea whatever. that they're treating it like we're making hereditary. This thing's going to be I mean. so That's painful what, for you to watch. But then, and in a twenty four way, that we're right. making we're making prestige trauma. But like yeah. something like Hereditary or, or yeah. Midsommar, the stuff that asks. No one's ever made at. a movie about trauma, though. I don't know what you guys are talking about. The trauma. That, no one. No one's done that yet. No. Yeah. I mean, people are it's, thinking about it, but no one's made yeah. a hard. David, movie I'm, ge- I'm going to embarrass you right now. Mm. They've been doing it. You have noticed because secretly, ah, this movie is about shit. trauma. <laughs> Wait, what? What are you talking about? Secretly, it's right. a movie about trauma. Okay. okay. Um. No, but those the Aster movies, I feel like part of what's so striking about them is there's just like such a psychological specificity to them. Yeah, they're truly difficult to watch. Right, they're so good. The conversations, but, not even like the subject matter of the mm-hmm. extreme things that have happened, but the way people interact with each other. And then this, every time there's like a horrible thing, it sort of feels like an after school special. Sure, in its pitch. Yeah. yeah. It's. I mean, there there are many parts of this movie that are like different after school specials sewn together. It looks weird. Yeah, it like it, it just also, the way he's framing it and shooting it. It looks it's not great. Oddly brightly lit. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's got that right. Yeah. It, the, and why is that? I guess it's just the I don't time. Know. I kept on trying to figure it out, but but it it's. It's oddly not very atmospheric looking. Yeah. Man, some other of the than the nightmare sequences. Yeah. Which some are, of the conversa- conversations with characters are so fucking weird. Yeah. Like I don't even know why. It's just it like it's just like be weird watching them talk well, to each other. There's a lot that's other. a time because there's also a time of it's so um puritanical too. Like yes. it's so Kate Blanchett not being allowed to have sex or even like get together in any way with a guy years after her husband's died, which is like, it's that I feel like is also the virgin horror movie trope of yes. being applied to this woman in this small town. It's like grown woman, mother of three. single mother of three. It's right. so strange. Yeah. yeah. And like everybody, it's, it's a movie that's really like everyone must suffer. I mean, we, I just broken record about this, but it just has to be invoked yet again. I do think so much of it is about him comparing himself to where the Coens are at any given point mm. in time. I had that thought too, yeah. I but mean, it's hard not to, right? It's hard not to. And it's just like they both started out in similar sort of like wackadoo, expressive camera, what have you, zones. And the Coens have now gone through like several rotations of different, like stretching themselves to different corners of growth and whatever. And I do think he's just in this zone where he's like, I can't just be Sam Raimi forever, right? So why didn't he learn more from them? I, I do think he's comparing, but why do they start to diverge so extremely in these films, these yeah. three Spider-Man films? What, they should actually be on these parallel tracks, both making interesting films. And, and his going towards these commercial films, but also trying to hold on to something that he thinks is gritty and raw, that it, it's, it's, it's like they didn't speak during that time. It's very odd. 
was Giovanni Ribisi the Ben Foster of 2000? Yes, 100%. It's one of those things where it's like, I don't think he's a bad actor necessarily. But you have but to. there's very specific constraints you need to put on You this need guy. to put constraints <laughs> Or on. you need to have the movie be bananas. Yes. In which case, like, let him go bananas. But this is the year after The Other Sister? The Other Sister, oh, God. which of course is... <laughs> Obviously, obviously, uh, no one came out of that one looking good. No, <laughs> you know it's not. He's I not, forgot about that's that. That's a trailer you I remember. Fucking just, have ruined yeah, a bunch of people's me days. As a child of like, oh this God. is illegal. You cannot do this. Oh my God! But it was that like obviously he's you know in those early that thing you do suburbia lost highway. He's like oh this guy's got an interesting face. Absolutely. Like what's going? And then he's so he's so good in saving. Private I was gonna Ryan. say this is where you're like and and I and think that's, that's one of, you're for it's Spielberg. You're gonna right. Work so hard and do, and that's he where wants. I think people like, start to go. Is this one of the most exciting actors of his generation? Yeah. Is this the incredible young guy? Yeah, just such a specific look that's so interesting. I love how Obviously he's been on he Friends. Sort of right? like he always looks a little sick. Squinty. He's a I love sick that, I love, actor, and I love that he's on Truly. Friends. Friends, actually, I think is he's like the most funny interesting part of his entire career. It's a very is that he's interesting. Like a, it's very yeah. interesting that Friends had a low key high school student marries his teacher plot just mm-hmm. nested yes. inside of like the usual antics. But this is the thing with him. He's very funny. Like Rubisi, almost anytime you ask him to be I was funny. I'm a big fan of him. Say, like, yeah, funny. And then also if you give him something like Saving Private Ryan, you're like, wow, he's putting a lot into this guy that other people could underplay, right? And then if you're like, it's a big character, he's like, Great. I have uh, here's an entire bag of tricks I've been willing waiting to put into This something. is the same year as Gone in 60 Seconds, which he's also kind of a lunatic in, right? Yeah, but at least he's a lunatic. Well, that's a lunatic. He's movie. in a cage movie yeah, 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 next yeah, yeah. like a Bruckheimer film. I, yeah. I feel like then it's kind of a little quiet from RBC for a bit. And then it's like, oh, he's in Lost in Translation, but it's like a small role. He's playing right. Spike Jones, yes. right? Very like it's small, like because yeah. 99 is Mod Squad. Other sister, and there's a third one. I mean, he's the narrator in the Virgin Suicide. Okay, uh, that's about it, really. Hmm. Uh, that's cool, though. Yeah, he's like very cool. Yeah, two thousand is the the, the gift. Bond gone sixty seconds, and of course, of course, uh, he uh, he went, entered the boiler room. He entered, which he's good in boiler room. He is a, a kind of again, kind of a you know high intensity movie. But he's whatever. one of these guys where it's like if you cast him to play a normal guy. You're like, oh, he's doing something interesting here. And if you mm-hmm. cast him to play a weird person, you're like, scale it all the way back. Yeah, but I can't fault only him though, because like it is, I fault more the people who open the box and unleash him. Absolutely, like, I that, agree. That being allowed, a, yes, no, <laughs> and enabled and encouraged. And he's, I'm imagining yeah. how many episodes of Friends do you think he's in? Seven. I looked this up last night. It's not seven. I know I'm close. Well, he's twenty. Ten. Wow. Know, so it's a friend's pretty good. Pretty good. Because he's a he's a family member. Uh he is. He's so, Phoebe's brother. I mean, that was the, the old Phoebe thing bring, of like I, Yeah. You know, she's got a long lost blah who's gonna show up. Who is it? But Balaban plays her dad, I think. Really? Pretty sure. But your wife I just went out. I know. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> kind of need it. The other problem is I don't know what your Wi-Fi is called because it's one of those uh, garbled letter. Um, can't, you con- can't you connect it to the um, phone? I can if I have to. Yeah. And you could connect to my phone. No, I'll, no, no, I'll no. go reset it. Yeah, go reset but it. But we're going to leave this all in because this is oh, fun. Absolutely. I mean, this is. I mean, I just <laughs> have to tell you, I have, I have to shout out that he played the sneakiest of all Pete's and Sneaky Pete. He did. Uh, that for like five seasons. One of those Amazon shows yeah. where they were just like, I don't know. You want to do more? Right. Fine. How do Film we feel about the here. nickname g Good? Love it. Good? Like, that's what you, if you saw him at a bar, you'd be like, g Hey. Yeah. I don't know if he'd love it. Right. He's apparently in Avatars I, 2 and 3. And 4 and 5? Well, I think with 4 and 5, we don't know because okay. they haven't filmed any of those, yeah. right? Yes. They filmed 2 and 3. Yeah. So like anyone but who's in those, that's a great example for Zealand. me of like right, yeah. nothing part of like just shitty businessman, and he makes it a little bit interesting. I think he is phenomenal in Avatar. Exactly, that's what have I'm you saying. Seen Avatar? The normal yes, guy. Yes, but show. I have no My memory fake. other than remembering watching it and being like, "This is better than I thought it was going to be." He's ostensibly the main bad guy, but he's a guy sort in of. an well, office. I mean, Lang is like, the main. Hey, come on, what are you well, doing? my favorite moment in Avatar, and we I think we may have talked about it on this podcast, and uh-huh. I like a lot of moments in Avatar. Yeah, of course, is when he's scrolling on their like 3D yeah. map. Uh, and it goes too far. Right. And he's like, come on, come on, bye, 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 bye. Right, right. It's one of those little like. It is just you never see anyone do that when they're doing wireframe 
<laughs> be like, oh, oh shit, yeah. I overshot it. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, though. I mean, it's like this this movie, this performance, and once again, I don't blame him as much as I blame everyone else for allowing him to do it. Yeah. I'm just like, this is the worst acting class like exercise I've seen where like, I think I've said this before about certain performances, but like when I would be in acting class and someone would like go this big, and then there'd just sort of be the silence. Everyone's and like tingling with the, embarrassment. Well, the other students are like, is that, I guess it's impressive right. they went that hard. Right. And then I just remember one time seeing a scene like that and my my uh, teacher, acting teacher, Elizabeth Camp, R.I.P., was uh, wonderful. Her very gentle way of saying it was she'd always go, well, it's good that you know you can do that <laughs> and that you can go that far. I don't think it's necessary, you know? And that's like, whenever I watch something like this, it's that tingly embarrassment. It's like, Giovanni, I'm impressed Here's that you can go that far. You don't need to do that. Don't you think they were telling him in this era, though, that they were saying, this is how you win an Oscar? He this is gets a fucking independent Spirit Award nomination for truly, supporting actor for this. A truly embarrassing Most of the critics are like, the movie's whatever, but Giovanni Ruiz, he this continues to, to solidify himself as. Yes, this is that's what the I want innocence to say. of this year. Yeah. This now, if you did this in a movie today, jail. I, <laughs> I'm not sure you go to jail, but I do think we definitely canceled. Hague, the Hague. Yes. No, I do think there would be an automatic kind of like this is super corny. This is not what we. It would need. immediately get this clipped is, and shipped onto Twitter, and it would go viral, exactly. and people would go, "Can you believe this is a scene this from is, this movie?" But in 1999. What I am Sam is coming up, yes. right? Like this is people are still like, yeah, this is what people want, right? Yes. This is what the voters that's are looking acting. for. Yeah. That's how, but that's how turned around everyone was. This is that that thinking allowing Giovanni Ribisi to do this shows the that's why Trump shows won. The well, no, but yeah, yes, <laughs> shows the inevitability of Trump, <laughs> but <some> also, <laughs> but it shows the inevitability of Spider Man. It shows the inevitability of Marvel. Yeah, we were at hmm. that point. We had, we had gone. Because even knowing that he was like in Virgin Suicide and all that, like those last translation Virgin Suicide were out there and people watching it, but somehow the last remnant of this kind of movie is go. the gift. But see, Starly, even what you're saying about the Coppola movies being out there, there's a bifurcation happening, right? Where it's like, if this is happening, this is indie, this is artisanal, mm -hmm. this is small scale, this is specialty small arm. Match. This is a small batch movie. It's a small yeah. batch movie. And then it's the fucking huge stuff. Like, there's already this thing of, like, what doesn't exist anymore? This movie. Yeah. What lies beneath getting made and released at the middle of the summer, you know? Yeah. Giovanni Ribisi is, like, giving this much performance in a film that is expected to perform commercially. Right, because they don't understand that this is... They're betting on the wrong horse. They don't understand what's about to happen. Again, they You're don't You're only allowed to go this big today if you play the Joker. This is the only, that's the only circumstance yeah. in which they allow you to go this big. He here's yeah, well, right. So it's like the character from the movies that are going to be, that are going to actually last and yeah. be everything are like, it's in the wrong time. He's had to step over the line and then he'll be, he'll be understated. Yeah, he'll here's be understated in Avatar. <laughs> here's what I want to say, Please. though, and maybe you agree with me, maybe you don't. I think Kate Blanchett is good in this movie. Okay. I think J.K. Simmons, Chelsea Ross, Ugh. Rosemary Harris, Gary, Gary, Cole. Gary Cole, those small, yes. you know, they all, I think everyone else is bad in this movie. I think everyone else is Hillary not Swank is bad. good in this movie. Hilary Swank is so bad in yes. this movie in that a similar way of like, she's like, I kind of get what this is, like a kind of a right. white trash girl and no one's talked to her right, or given her notes or stopped her. Yes. Like she's just doing the most caricatured version of it and it's super basic and it's super bad. It's also funny that like, where's Hillary Swank from? Hillary Swank, isn't she Canadian? No, she's not. Oh my God, Nebraska. I just read, I was just looking at the BuzzFeed she list of who, who self-made and who was born rich. Well, this she is was, why it came out. She, she grew up in a trailer. Yeah. She grew up in absolutely tough circumstances. Uh, although she, you know, obviously she was in the next Karate Kid when she was a teenager. She's one of those kids who moves to California, starts acting. Yes. To support her family. To support though. her exactly. family. That kind is, of that's the thing about that list, Charlie, yeah. that yeah. I also read. I, where it yeah. keeps being like, yeah, oh, I read these the people are self-made. Well. I'm like, almost all the people you're talking about were worked to death by their family's Correct. children. Yes. Like, Correct. They became the yeah. money horse. Yeah. I mean, that list I couldn't, I, I kind of anyway. wish that a list like that would come that out every day because I really, it was... the. Asking my friends to guess which it was, yeah. Um, I, I just like look. She did not grow up in the South, 
but no, I mean, you well, imagine that like so. it's not like Gwyneth Paltrow trying to play this part where you're like Gwyneth Paltrow has never met a woman like this in her life before. <laughs> you, you know, you're like Hillary. She's met Hillary Swank. You're like Hillary Swank <laughs> should be able to. She should do this. I, I, it, it's a really bad performance. It's really, a bad and also performance. post it post boys don't cry. Right. You just cannot believe that this is her very right good after boys don't yeah. cry mm -hmm. fucking but up again, this badly. People thought this was. They took this serious. They, these I actors know, I took think this so no, I just seriously. Think no one's telling them like, hey. Too much mustard. Agreed. I think they also, I think Billy Bob cast a spell on Hollywood. The sling blades yes. can confuse was, people. They all true. think they can say French fried potatoes. Yes. You're right. And then, that's and, what all of him, them think they're doing being, here. You're right. He was their smartest friend because the yeah. way he acted where he was like, I'm not the guy, I'm not Hollywood. I can write circles right. around all of you. I'm the real deal. And they were also, he's also seduced everybody. Like, I just think that they could, they were blinded. They could not think straight. That's, that's a, face a great him. example of just like, right. Sling Blade should be too big a performance. Yes. And the trick there is that he makes it feel naturalistic. And when Sam Raimi talks about the script, they're like, he has an ear for dialect. And I'm like, he doesn't in this film, at least. Or, this or is, maybe I mean, he needs to massage acting actors to understand his ear like it's like yeah someone like tarantino where the language is very specific and you need to be on the right tonal wavelength of oh he does his own billy bob because even like in civil plan i love watching billy bob but i'm not sure i think he's a real person i don't sound like i think anyone else really talks like him but i do like i mean what he's doing that's the thing of him just being like plucked out of the ether what were you gonna say david no, I was going to move oh, on to the other actors. Greg. I want to give Keanu credit because I think he's really fucking trying. Yes. But that's the thing. I think he is the best of the people we're talking about right now. He like, doesn't I, pull it off. He doesn't pull it it's off an, and it feels just a little too trying. It's also an but impossible a, character, though. Impossible. There's no it's not way, a great character. They're trying to make us him be sympathetic. Yeah. Like he's got a Confederate flag on the front. It, that's also well, an era it, thing. Because the character's written as a red herring where it's like, he comes out of the gate like, I'm going to kill you. I beat up my wife. Worst I'm guy crazy. in the world. crazy. Right. So you're like, okay. I mean. He, yeah. And so then you're immediately just like, I guess he can't be the murderer because it's too obvious. Right. But he's just ground. And it was that moment so post Matrix yeah. where people were like, Keanu's back. What do we do? What with do him? we think about that? And then he's in this, and people are like, "Well, he shouldn't do that, right?" right. Like, I mean, he got bad reviews for this movie. Can you just quickly pull up the run of films in between The Matrix and The Matrix? We Reloaded. talked about it briefly I know, but on I just, the Patreon the episode. Replacements, yeah. Sweet the replacements, The Replacements, The Watcher, right? Uh, which I think was filmed pre Matrix. Right. She plays a serial killer. Yes. Uh, the Gift, Sweet November, and Hardball. Yeah, it's a tough run. Wild. That, I was watching the interview where he said, he's about, when he's talking about this movie, and he said, I hadn't played a bad guy in a while, and I couldn't think of when he'd ever played a bad guy. But I guess that serial killer movie, because he doesn't play bad guys. He doesn't usually play bad guys. He is a bad guy, I suppose, in The Watcher. Watcher and watch this are the him. same year? Uh, yes. Yeah. The Watcher is one of those great, like, opened number one, but to $7 million. It had, like, three like... weekends at number one, and all of them were <laughs> under $10 million. Does he ever play a bad guy? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, he just tossed off. I hadn't done that in a while, as though that was a thing that we'd ever known him to have done. Yeah, it's it, it is interesting. I mean, like, it's it's a different type of red herring because he turns out to be kind of a sweet guy, even though he seems really scary and haunted. But that's the problem. Is like, there's no way to make that character oh. the worst person in the world a sweet guy. But what I was gonna say is, Private Lives of Pippa Lee. Uh, the Rebecca Miller movie. Which you bring up on Patreon. Yeah. Mostly just think about how good he is in that movie and it was the first film I maybe saw Keanu come into with like gravitas. Where like what he's now just he has in spades where it's just like this guy just has some weight to his presence and whatever. Uh, and he's able to just dispense naturally. And that movie he does end up being a sweetheart but he ends up being a sweetheart without ever being as awful as he is in the beginning of this movie. Um, but right. this thing, it's like you feel the effort of him trying to be scary. Yeah. And in so many it, of the quotes that JJ pulled up, the, Hillary Swank's like, it's tough because he's such a nice so guy nice, that he didn't right. want to touch me in scenes. And I said, you have to hit me. Right, you have to at least pretend to hit me. I, don't right. wanna, I do think he's scary, though. I, I his violence was believable. That's why me. I want to give him partial credit because yes. I think at a couple moments he is genuinely scary. I don't yeah. think it works. I think you feel the effort. Yeah, I mean, I get what you're saying. I think you feel the effort more with just the character itself. But when he's actually being violently scary, I found that convincing. The, partial credit. I yeah. prefer his performance to Rabisi's. Yes, to Swanks. Well, yes, Greg Kinnear. It's just kind of the role he played often. It's just usually it would be like, he seems like a nice boyfriend and he's a bad boyfriend. Right. It's the same shit. It's just like, yeah. he seems like a nice teacher man, but he's a bad teacher man. Right. 
it's just a more muted version of it. I guess, but I don't think I don't find him that threatening at the end when he needs to be. No, no, I agree. And then the Holmes of it is so odd. I think she is flat out abysmal. Oh, she's (laughs) bad. She's bad. She's bad. She's crazy. She's bad. She's bad. And there's no excuse for her being this bad. But what is more bizarre about it is just that this movie was like, she needs to do this to prove that she can be in grown-up movies. Right. And then her role is like nothing, and she fucks it up. And she's so naked. She also, like, naked, to, to, for briefly. this to be the role that proves something about yourself when I actually just use her for her body. Like, it's a miscalculation for what... It's but not going it, to make her... You're going to see her differently, but not in the way she There's hopes. a quote I that, found where she was like, I'm not uncomfortable with nudity if it's yeah. the right script and it's yeah. for a reason. The gift was obviously the right film That's what I'm to saying, do the that. Billy Bob spell. And I'm I, like, it, she was cast only to be naked or a dead body. Yes. I mean, those that... Oh, and she it says, a what's the matter? See something bad? Right. Um, you better fuck me now, or whatever the fucking line I did but at the I really was. think it's the, you know, Anne Hathaway did this, right? You know, a lot, a lot yep. of actors who are, you know, perceived as teen... Havoc, but, you're talking about mm-hmm. your... Right, the Drew mm-hmm. Barrymore run, Where they're like, certainly. what is the most lurid against right. type role yes. I can find? That's like, right. go get it for me. When it's she, not just, I oh, they want me to be yeah, naked, sure. Course. It's like, no, 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 I need to, like, completely toss the W be in the yes. garbage can right now. But in like, so many of those well, what's films, her name from Game of Thrones is doing now. What's her Arya. Um oh, uh, like she won't, Maisie she, Williams. Maisie she Williams just gave just one like, of those interviews. It's like oh. she wants to be it started happening in Game yeah. of Thrones where she wanted to be seen as as like a like a sexual, you know, like the, she the, was it's she's so boy. when you're <laughs> and now you know, she just, famous for being a cute Yeah, I now she's like or whatever. I, she's like I'm the only she's like I don't want to be cast because I'm the only I she's so she basically just wants to constantly be doing nude scenes. Yeah. I guess what's confusing about it to me, though, is those other examples we're talking about, they are the lead or the co-lead. Yeah, no, right. Like, it's a much entire, more juicy role. Right. Or this whatever. just asks her to do nothing. You know, she, yeah. she has, like, five isolated lines. All of her line readings are just, like, thuds. Yeah. And then the rest of the movie, she's either a scary dead body covered in makeup. Which is kind of cool when she's, like, floating in the tree. It's the best part cool of her image, performance. Right. Or, yeah, or yeah, she's yeah. a naked body in flashbacks. Yeah. It's, like, yeah. one or the other. Or she's a dead naked body. Yes. The ice storm, she's, like, kind of pops in. She's really good. Yes. Disturbing Behavior, which was like teen Stepford Wives with mm-hmm. Marsden. Kind of a fun movie. Yeah. And it, like this was a time when like almost every female friend I had watched Dawson's Creek and loved yes. Dawson's Creek. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I would see any movie that any of the Dawson's Creeks were in because yeah. they wanted to, you know, it's like Disturbing Behavior, we're going. And I, I would be like, okay, yeah. sure. I, I actually was a sporadic Dawson's Creek viewer. Sure. Even as a teen TV show fan, I never could get into Dawson's Creek. I don't want to wait. Right, right. Uh, um, but I saw Varsity Blues and right. I saw Disturbing Behavior. I saw Go, which she's fun in. Yeah, she's yeah. fun. I was I, into Sarah her. Sarah Polly's kind of the, the lead. The lead. Yeah. But she's fun in she's Go. Fun in I, I just think. I don't think I've ever seen Teaching Mrs. Tingle. I think I have, weirdly. But that movie was sort of a misfire. Um, yeah. And I, then I remember her being okay in Wonder Boys, which is the same year she's as She's very this. good in Wonder yeah. Boys. Yeah. She's very good in Wonder Boys. That's her wheelhouse, Shaban. Michael Shaban is her. Yeah. Did he not, not also write Ice Storm? He no, didn't, but it's no, a similar. No, who wrote Ice Storm? Ice Storm's... Uh, Rick, Moody? Rick Moody is the yeah, author. That, but it's that, that, that grouping. I just think Novels she too. was in an interesting place because unlike, say, a Blake Lively or whatever, right? Like someone who's on the big teen show of the moment, Amisha Barton, what have you. There, She had that girl next door quality, which was obviously inherent to the entire premise of that mm-hmm. show. But I do think, like... Guys thought, boys our age thought she was really cute, and like girls who watched the show related to her. Yeah, she seemed personable. Sure, unlike I agree often, with everything you're saying. The girl at the center of the big hot teen I mean, shows. She's the girl next door in Dawson's my, Creek. You know, she's next door to him. So I think everyone but was like, she has to TV. have movie star potential because she's yeah. not just. I still think girls. She's not just a Beale or whatever. You know. Yes, that's true. Well, I guess I feel like girls felt like boys like her <laughs> in a way yeah. that they don't like Jessica Biel, and I want to understand what that is. Right. Like you, I guess you could feel like I have more of a chance to be the girl next door than Jessica. That's, than, than that's what I think Jessica it was. Biel. I think like when Jennifer Love Hewitt was like put in movies, it was like this isn't going to work, guys. This isn't going to work. But Katie Holmes, people were like, this should work. Mm-hmm. Sure. And she does it when she does, and like Ice Storm, when she hard. plays that role, it is. But that's pre Dawson's Creek. But she is she's that good. role, though. Oh, yeah. She's and, yes. it, and she's, I think that's her best. Yes. Her at her best. Yes. 
almost by default, but yes, what is it? She then? looks like the most 2003 person or something. Do you know what I in mean? In this? Or, or just, you just mean general? In general. Like her, in general. I mean, she's very iconic of a very specific but like, sliver in, in this pop way culture. where I'm like, People you know, don't look like that. Anymore. It you know, is funny when you, she shows up saying? in Batman Begins and 2005, you're like, huh, her face. <laughs> like it, it's suddenly like the movie culture has shifted and her face doesn't totally make it is, sense. It is still odd that she's in Batman Begins. She's also surprisingly tall and you don't, Right, you don't yeah. register when Dawson's Creek. You're not thinking of her as a tall girl because totally. she's very tall. Beek's really tall, right? Yeah, and she just got this little button nose right. and this little chipmunk she face. Seems, like she, she does not. Yeah. She seems like a small girl. She does not seem like a towering. She's girl. like five she's, nine. Five, she's five I nine. Vanderbeek is a six. And footer. when people, you can tell in this movie yeah. because she, you see so much of her body that yeah. she's long. But I've she's, seen other people who've long. spotted her, and she's yeah. like, she's a very tall woman. And that's there's a movie. What's the movie years? There's like Jonathan Ames movie that no one saw. I saw it at Sundance. Kevin Klein's in it and she's in it. Oh, the one the, he's got the fucking flower on the poster. It takes place in East Village. Oh, I've never heard fucking, of anyone seeing it. It's not it called for, The Other Man? Something like something that. Like that. Uh, John sorry. C. Riley's in it. He plays a homeless person, I think. Probably. I remember liking it. I never have heard anyone mention it ever again. I thought it did screening at Sundance and I was like, this is going to be Kevin Klein. This is it. He's going to be the new. He's Bill Murray now. Sure. He's this is this era of Kevin Klein. Older statesman. Yeah. I mean, he's Klein. so good. I think yeah. Kevin Klein is someone who. He's, the reason he's not in stuff is because he's choosing not to be in stuff. They call him Kevin the Decline. Extra Man. <laughs> yes, Klein. the Extra Which man. was directed by um, Sherry Berman and Robert Pulcini, the, the American Splendor guys. And right. Jonathan Ames wrote it. Right. That's Have good. never heard of this movie. <laughs> Paul Dano is in it, apparently. It's got a stack cast. It's good. I mean, at least I remember it being good. And she's in it, right? She sure yeah. is. Ben, I, mean, I flicked you a couple of comedy yeah, points. Yeah, Ben flicked me comedy points. I just want to say, I didn't create I, Kevin I, Decline. I, that was a thing said the industry at the time because he turned down things so much. I'll, t I'll take the points. Ben took uh, him back. David, yeah. What's a game where no one wins? Uh, Monopoly. No, people win. They just usually give up before the game ends. Right, that, that's why I'm thinking of it. People are usually just like, "I'm sick of this thing." <laughs> and then yeah, just leave. <laughs> Monopoly. That's the game they should call Family Feud. If you know what I'm saying. What? If you play it with your family, that only tracks if you play it with your family. David, the game I'm thinking of is the waiting game. Uh, of course. Uh, no one ever wins the waiting game. No one ever wins. When it comes to hiring, don't wait for great talent to find you. Find them first with Indeed. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. Uh, yeah, because Indeed, it's the, it's the hiring program. We've heard of the Batman. It's the hiring program. You can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed is the hiring partner that can help you do it all. You find great talent faster. You use instant match, virtual interviews, assessments. Let, let, Griff, let me rant for a second about instant rant, match. Please go off. Go off, King. 80% of employers get quality candidates uh, whose resume on Indeed matches their job descriptions the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed data. Holy guacamole. <laughs> Um, you know, and those candidates invited to apply through Instant Match are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search, according to US Indeed data. So as soon as you sponsor a post on Instant Match, you get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. It's doing all the hard work for you. I'm a little worried, David. Uh, why are you worried? You're a worry wart. You just went off so hard. I'm a worry wart, but you went off so hard. Uh huh. You went off the handle talking about Indeed right there. Okay. So you think you need to reel me in? What's going on? I don't know. I just feel like I I need like some sort of offer, some sort of special deal to cushion the blow. Uh. Well. Uh, there's just nothing to do. Oh, wait a second. You can start hiring now with $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash check. This offer is good for a limited time. So claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash check. Indeed.com slash check. Terms and conditions apply. Pay per qualified applicant not available for all users. Need to hire. You need Indeed. Um... So Katie Holmes is not good in this film, and I would say this film, prop, you know, mostly unfortunately because it is basically like a gentleman's six-ish movie yeah. that's all right, 
becomes this weird footnote joke. It's in Harold and That's Kumar. That's what I was trying to remember which movie it's it is. It's Harold and Kumar, right, where, right. you know, Krumholtz and Thomas Ian Nicholas, I think. Yes. Or Eddie K. Thomas, one, of the, the one of the three and neighbors. Yes. Are the Rosen, they're Rosenberg yeah. and Gildenstein or whatever. Yes, correct. And the joke of that is like, oh, they have their own separate adventure that you don't see right. in Harold and Kumar, but you right. pop in with them. And at the start, they're like, we're going to watch Katie Holmes. She's Jewish and she's naked in this movie. And yeah. like, it's like, oh, horny Jews. But Who would have thought? The reputation of this movie was, oh, Katie Holmes had such a girl next door persona that she seemed like an actress who would never get naked. And then there's a movie where pretty much all she does is get naked. And at this early stage of the internet not being as extreme as it was, it was like, I've heard there's sure, a rumor yeah. Yeah. that if you watch this movie, you see her boobs. Even from the vantage point of today, when you have access to so much, I could understand watching this movie now why this would be a film that that, that you'd want to see it. It's because of the way she's shocking shown, the way, nudity in that shocking sense. Shocking yes. and the way she's shown, like it's. It, it if that's what you're there to see, you're not going to be disappointed. No, it's the like use a of it. look. It's a perfect movie to like fucking slow down. Yeah, you know, because it's like she's got these scenes where she's like on display, but they move really quickly and they're like cross fades of Raimi style. There's unfortunate critics. The critics don't handle her nudity well. Oh, David, I don't the, critic, the critical community of 2000 wasn't really too <laughs> up on uh, talking about this stuff sensitively. <laughs> what this is like, a year this before Harry thing. Knowles writes his cunnilingus <laughs> review of Blade Two. The whole thing, though, with nudity in American films. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Is let's it unpack like, it. Well, I mean, it's yeah. like I, I, I really, I really do think everyone just needs to settle down about it and not be stunned anytime they see a naked breast. But yeah. then, like, nothing is helped by the fact that then even critics will be like, and. Uh, keep your eyes open around minute 100 of this one or you know like the, it, I mean, it's not so much true anymore but back then it was absolutely it was shameless. and it's difficult because there's such a now it's like oh Americans are such prudes and also like Americans like are fucking like it's a national news story right. if a woman's there's naked there's this whole yeah, I mean, she's like ID is like the smoking hot babe right. <laughs> you need like a it's serious but also like Giovanni Ribisi should be given an Oscar like it is there's a puritanical wave now of like no sex scenes should ever be in movies and people who just assume that anytime anyone's naked in a film it is some form of emotion abuse or coercion or, or like, by what the do production. They get paid for this. Or right, like, yeah. Why are they Disgusting. why are they doing that? What kind of game is this they're playing? Right. Whereas like French actors are like, yeah, I fucked a killer whale in my last movie. Who cares? Yeah. Like right. but the problem with Katie Holmes being naked in this film is it feels like her ticket in. Like no one else yes. has to do it. And, and it is very easy to project to be a narrative. In this adult on it. movie, yeah. that's what she had to do. And she's talked about it once again, as I said, like that that script demanded it. I was happy to do it. But you're like, it just feels like you're that's it's if I do this, yeah, no one looks at me the same way ever again. Yeah, I get to like evolve to the next stage. And yeah, I mean, talk about I, the overcorrection of people being like, maybe all this is fucking bad is like that we had like 60 years of critics being like, Katie Holmes doesn't give a good performance in this movie. She gives two good ones. Yeah. You know, like these fucking reviews where people have to make the joke about whatever. And this, re and this movie also so with the weird stuff that Kate Blanchett's not even allowed to like kiss someone else like yes. there is such a madonna whore stuff about like just weird there's issues in this film underneath the surface that are not being grappled with especially because outside of the first evil dead sam Raimi is not a very sexual filmmaker no he's not great at that this probably is only but i don't think he nudity, it's not like i think he handles right? the sex scenes bad in this movie it's just it's just the, how it's only on all, all falls only yeah. on katie holmes and then and also he does like i I am interested in his like idea about punishing. Like I think his like punishing the audience. He also wants to punish himself. I think there's a correlation in kind of Giovanni Ribisi's character and Sam Raimi, the way he like when Giovanni Ribisi says when he's like not grappling with his dad yet and he says like it's okay he had to hit me and I'm like that's kind of how Sam Raimi feels about audiences like there's something there's very something boyish about Raimi in every sense and I think the reason simple plan works so well even though it seems out of the box for him and it's the only one of these adult movies that really connects is because it is such a morality tale like there's something so biblical about simple plan where the lessons of it are very clear and it's like fundamentally good people struggling to remain good and all of that. But yeah, I mean, Kim, Paxton was almost played the Kinnear part in this. And you're like, Paxton could have made this work. That's the yeah. kind of tortured normal guy you want here. Kinnear is better. sort of just giving low energy. Well, the thing with Kinnear is it's like they are just trying to pull a trick on us. Right. But the yeah. thing is, a lot of people tried to pull that trick at the same time. I know. Him. I've looked yeah. at the poster. I know it's going to be Kinnear. It's like <laughs> he still talks soups. Greg Kinnear, obviously, he just yeah. got an Oscar nomination a couple years ago. 
It's not that he doesn't act, right. but I feel like he's still like, oh, Greg Kinnear with the big pearly also, white smile. There are three male faces Swank. on this poster, and two of them look like the scariest men in the world, and the third one looks like the guy from Talk Soup. I'm guessing you're going to have the guy from Talk Soup be the killer. Right. I like your been, take. It should have been Hillary Swank. I agree. There's a moment when yeah. she comes in and says that I, I'm glad she died. She's taken my man. And that's the only time they try to throw this other person in. And I guess Gary Cole they try to throw in too, but you know he didn't do it. But it, it should have been Hillary it's Swank. It's the better it should, version. It's, yeah. more, it's, it's got at least there's complications to it. Here's another thing that sucks about Katie Holmes in this movie, though. Her character, not to back yeah. on her performance more, right? But just like even as written, the only things we ever see her do when she's alive essentially are fuck guys fight with guys she's fucking or has just fucked or the one moment where she comes in and it's like they're coasting off of her reputation at the time where it's like here is the most sort of like suburban looking lady in the world hugging her husband with a cup of coffee and going like what do you see say something bad right but like she has no character outside of she just can't stop fucking everybody she doesn't even make any sense like why is she marrying greg kinnear why is she like her fucking everyone makes more sense than her getting married like you don't even see flirtations you just see fucking and aftermath i think a different it's like all the sexual energy of this town the horror movie version of this story is that all the sexual of this movie is all the sexual energy of this town is funneled into this one woman and right. no one else is allowed to feel any have any sexual right she's like the ivo shandor output. building that's just like collecting yeah. all of the energy yeah. the sexual yeah. energy i think a different director might be able to handle this differently because obviously it's sort of like oh in this small town mm-hmm. what darkness bun- bundle bubbles under the surface mm-hmm. katie holmes secretly an adulteress <laughs> giovanni rabisi victim of abuse right yes. you know Blue and, but it's, so when you watch the movie minute one you're like everyone in this town is completely fucked up this town is completely fucked up right i don't get how this psychic has not been drawn into every single goddamn insane shit you know thing that's happened already this feels like a town where every home is a cabin with an economicon in the basement like everyone in this town is going through their own evil dead but that but that's why in that regard i do think sam raimi's the right one it's just he didn't let himself go as full into the darkness as he wanted because that's what he wants every house to be that fucked up yes that but that's why I think right. He just can't handle the tone. There's no real then, realism but, to this, and like it might work if there was. And I think some Thornton maybe could give you that or whatever. That's why it's again simple plan. Simple plan. I went and watched Simple Plan after this because I so wanted. I first I wanted to be like well, just maybe every movie from this time that era was not good. <laughs> like yeah. I needed to, I needed a a constant. I needed to have something to compare this to, and tonally. And see the, the location that's similar. There's so many similarities. Yeah, and sure. it comes before, and then he manages to lose. But I think with Simple Plan, Sam Raimi understands that buttoned up Midwestern. Yes like attitude a lot better than he understands the South, which he doesn't. And I think he understands know. the psychological dynamic like, of what if, if I found a bag of money, how would I? All the Southern right. stuff in this feels like I have just gone to, where is this Georgia? Right. Yeah. You know, and I've been like, I think I know what it's like around you. Like I just, I, and like, to be clear, I don't. Right. <laughs> like, I know. You know what I, what I think I know about this shit is from movies. Like, this is my thing. I'm watching this and I'm like, I feel like I'm offended by how broad these characterizations are, even though I have no right to say that as some sure, shitty it's New not Yorker. Really my but I can tell right. this is wrong. Like it all feels like Princess and the Frog level yeah. characterization he, of the it's South. It's like people yeah. in the South are in each other's business, but in this movie, it's like to a degree that is just, it's insane. Right. It's like there's no way that everyone knows about everything that's going on with each other in this but way. they also don't care about each other. They're also just so mean right. to each other. I'm like, isn't that, is that, that doesn't seem Southern, like how everyone's... The I, only bits I, I like are like J.K. Simmons. Although I don't... Yeah. When yeah. she's talking to him and she's like, you know, saying, I saw a vision of this and he's yeah. kind of, he immediately knows like, well, that could be half the place. He's like, well, a pond, you know, like where I'm like, this guy seems to actually know the town. Cole Simmons Ross. Are yeah. like this trifecta in this. Chelsea movie. Ross is really good in the Chelsea scene where they Ross. drag her body out of the water. What a what a guy. He's the. Can we shout him out for yeah. a second? Because he's yeah. been in. Sure. He's in a uh, simple plan. Yep. Right, and he comes back and drag me to hell. He does. Yeah. Two and 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 different roles. Like he. Yeah. The he has range. He's got incredible range. He is a guy. So he looks a lot like my recently departed great uncle Earl, who was a family member I I, I loved dearly. Yeah. And so I remember seeing Chelsea Ross show up as a kid in movies. Maybe when I was a kid, not and when Chelsea Ross like, was a kid. Looks like my uncle, sure. right? I think he's in Richie Rich as he like a, a security guard or something. And I was like, oh, that's the Uncle Earl actor. 
But he's one of those guys where every time he fucking shows up, I'm like steady ass hand. Oh, remember him in uh, Mad Men? Mad Men. That that was such a good. Uh, that was the thing. Run on Mad Men. So he was this like memory guy from my childhood. I felt like I hadn't seen him for a while. He has that run on Mad Men where he's so good. And now anytime I'm watching like a '90s movie where Chelsea Ross shows up, I get so fucking excited he's got a he's great only got face three scenes in this right maybe but he is really good his first scene by the way of course is katie holmes seeming like she wants to fuck her dad as well <laughs> like that's how over sexualized this yeah. character is um, um but that heart attack scene yes with dragging her body out is incredible it's intense it's well I think done the tension of the drag like yeah anytime yeah. raimi gets to play with Tension, spooks, Stuff nightmares, that, visions of But it's horror. not what he wants. Keanu's he, he, best scene is the scene where Keanu comes into her house and starts like, and he's like, it's I'm the a scene good, where unbroken, it feels most unprecedented handheld camera. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anytime like something fucked up could happen. Right. right now. It's, yeah. But it, it, that's, that's why I don't understand why he couldn't. I mean, I'll it's, say, he let him go. Like, just he's back in a haunted house, and just his he won't let his, himself do his it. He's angst he about wants it. To, and his you own, know, his he own, wants to not break the reality. He talks about this right to make the supernatural not exciting. Yeah, yeah. This but, time, I, look, I understand <laughs> that you object to these. Yeah, no, but I just I'll say I when feel I saw bad this, for him. It's, I, it's more that so, I wish that. But he, maybe he had to do. He that. didn't. No, but I. It sounds like uh, he didn't. The way he talks about this film is like. In the interview I read, he was like, you know, in the in the baseball movie, that was a very clear thing. We both wanted the same thing. We wanted it to be a commercial film that everyone mm -hmm. wanted to watch. This one, the, it sounds like he pretty much was given free reign, and he put these restraints on himself. Budget. Within the small budget. Within the small budget, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he wasn't, it just, he decided that he couldn't go for it, and that's... Yeah, yes. That's, I, that feels like a missed opportunity. It just, he doesn't only yell and get so many movies. But I do think so much of it is the Coens thing, where if you look at the reviews of... The Coens and Raimi at the beginning, it's just sort of like, wow, they have so much energy. There's so much ingenuity. There's so much invention here. I, I don't know if any of these characters exist or if any of this really means anything. Like people were dismissive to all of their early films. And you look at like the Raising Arizona reviews and they're like, eh, it's like a cartoon. There's like no substance to this. And then that Fargo moment, right? I mean, and you have like the Miller's Crossing, Barton Fink lead into that. And then Fargo has this big explosion. I think he just had this thing of like, almost like looking around at his friends and being like, why am I the only one who's not married? You know? Mm, right. Isn't Where that he was plan? Like, isn't that what simple it plan? It is, except and that is not a hit. That's the problem like, is that simple plan hit. doesn't blow up as much it gets as Fargo a couple does. Oscar nominations or whatever, but like it feels like it should have done better than it did. That I think he's like, I still haven't gotten the one that yeah. totally connects. So I just I can't the Spider Man of it all. It's, I know like he's about to build the bomb. Like we it is. recorded Spider Man earlier this week, so like I watched yeah, yeah. these two movies in flip order, mm -hmm. and it is bizarre to just watch them and be like, Spider Man's the more personal film. I, I agreed. Um, and and it changes everything. He's gonna get his wish. He is in a way that then is. He, it doesn't pay off for him. That's but it's, the weird it thing. It pays off for but, everyone. Else. Yeah, like he gets to make more Spider-Man movies. Yeah, he gets to make one more horror film that feels very from the mind of Sam right. Raimi, and then it's like, I guess I'll see you later. And the the superhero genre has sort of outrun me. But I guess in the leg, but in a way that you can look when you when we trace back, yeah. how did we get to the Marvel world that we live in? Yeah, uh, the superhero 100%. movie we we can. Tra he, I'm not saying it's good. I mean, I, I'm glad. I'm not saying Spider Man's not good. I'm not saying it's good that Spider Man came out and changed everything. Yeah. I'm saying you're going to be able to trace who built the bomb. Yes. And even if he didn't pay off in that thing, he did change everything. It did ultimately did. change everything he in did. a way that he did not, he, he couldn't even have known what to wish. If he wanted to make an impact, he did. Look, I'll tell you some more context about this film. Please. They only had 44 shooting days. Now, these days, that's, <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. But he's like, it was outrageous. Right. He never shot for so few days. Yeah, I mean, like forty-four shooting. That's like basically two months of work, right? I mean, like to to me now, like yeah, but everything's bad now. That's why it's mm, interesting. No, but uh, like not right. to go off on a side tangent here, but this is why there are more and more stories of like horrible accidents happening on well, set. No, that's true, hundred percent. I but, but you I, know, I'm not going off on a whole tangent about that, but that is a fact. These are all part and parcel of the same thing, which is everyone wants to get movies made quicker. Right. And cheaper, cheaper now right. and they end up paying out the nose later in post-production but uh it, it, that used to be the proper amount of time you can't make a movie in less than 90 days or whatever like it was just impossible to consider doing it a, a truly strange fact in my opinion is they had like more than a week of rehearsal yes nothing about this movie screams we honed these characters but i guess in this rehearsal they're all like 
that's maybe Ruvisi's like bigger, and they're like, yeah, this is crazy. We're we're generating All here, you know. And about, Keanu like, and Hillary Swank spent the week together talking about every detail of the right. character's life, including how they had sex with each other. And they went like, to the like way therapy they had... groups to yes. like absorb abusive relationships firsthand yes. and all this shit. And then you read the quotes where it was like Hillary Swank being like, we had to develop a rhythm where he had permission to mishandle me and all this shit. It's so It just doesn't really bizarre. translate. But no. you're talking yeah. about the whole like Southern character of the movie being wrong, right? There's the Chelsea Ross quote there. Because there are a lot of good Chelsea Ross quotes because on top of everything else, on top of being a fucking G, Chelsea Ross is apparently best friends with Billy Bob He's Thornton. He's great pals with Gr- but which makes sense. Right. They, yeah. they, do, they do seem like they should be friends. Two men with otter faces. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he... Um, yep. yep. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but he said that like... Billy Bob was really angry about the Keanu casting because he's like, I can give you a list of 75 guys who are this type of guy. A hundred guys wrote. who would be right for this role. I grew up and around Keanu. these guys. I know what these guys are fucking like. Now, Chelsea Ross, to his credit, says, I've worked with Keanu a number of times. He gets busted a lot. No one works harder than he does. But he does seem to also be allowing like, but at the same time, Billy remembers growing up in Arkansas and Keanu's not the kind it's of guy not, you would have seen down there. Right, or whatever, and you, you never know, like, stop thinking about the fact that you're watching Keanu Reeves doing this. No. He's again, the, the most the, California-looking yes, fucking guy. Yes, he, But the character's not exactly like, it's not exactly like, the character also has no nuance whatsoever. No, it, so it, but I understand, two, it, it's funny that he has this facial hair that it, at the time was like, beard. Yeah. Oh, this patchy beard he can't quite sell. And now that's like basically his John Wick facial hair. Yes. It's funny that now he actually can make that work. It is yeah. funny that the John Wick thing, they literally like took a ruler to his face and they were like, if we just make these three lines here around where your patchiness is, suddenly it works. It looks right. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah, for yeah, 20 yeah. years, people have been like, what's up with Keanu's embarrassing beard that he can't grow? Uh, um, now he's Mr. Beard. He, right. I just think Billy Bob's point is even if this character isn't rendered with any great detail, it's like, I could give you a list of a hundred good Southern character actors, young men who will just show up and give you this vibe for free. And all this role needs to be is vibe. And now you've turned it into an experiment for Keanu Reeves to show his range. And Hillary Swank too, I would say that they should, the same list should have been given for Hillary Swank. Yeah. Cause that's the kind of character that if they would just had, she's so distracted. You know who should have played Hillary Swank's part? Kim Dickens, who well, Kim is, Dickens in is better movie, in this movie yeah. as Kate Blanchett's best yeah. friend. She's putting mustard on it, but I love Kim Dickens, and she obviously. I didn't understands. want her to go away. I wanted that scene to be longer. But like, she's, and she's in the right tone. Fun. She's in the right milieu. She's yeah. fun, and she can. She's fun, but like she could have played the uh, the Hillary Swank yes. role perfectly. Yes, Kate Blanchett interviewed many a psychic uh, as part of her preparation. This other shit. I yes, um, <laughs> she does say that. Uh, she had five readings in one week that were contradictory. So that's slightly snide or, you know, slightly mm-hmm. uh, disparaging of her. But then also apparently when doing press for Nightmare Alley, which is also a movie about psychics yes. or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, mentalists. Mm-hmm. Um, she said like years ago, a psychic told me that I would have four children and other things like that, that at the time I was like, this is nonsense. And of course I ended up having four children Yeah. and now I'm afraid to see her again because what if she's like, you know, it's just funny that for the press tour for Nightmare Alley, she was just recalling her. Uh, yeah. She know, never her, put it together. Part. She never, she ne- never occurred to her that she could maybe be like, I have three children, but the psychic told me four. So now, I mean, it, she does have oh, that subconscious. Like she's never... playing a role. It's not like that. She just woke up and there were four children. Maybe she did. You don't know. Yeah, actually, Starley, you don't know. No, actually, <laughs> don't, I think yeah. you're right. Um, have you guys ever gone to a know. fortune teller? I have. I, I have, although not... I feel like it's mostly been at like a party or something. You know, like someone will do that. Like, I don't think I've ever been like, I'm going to a fortune teller today and like Googling the nearest one. Or it's whatever. something you know, I love to do when I'm traveling in a new city. Oh, interesting. I'll just go to like the fortune teller. That's a very Ben thing. Yeah. I Can you tell the difference... Between no, the two, like, can you tell? Are there regional like differences? Like a DC versus yeah. a yeah. Chicago? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they usually <laughs> the are very guys, like vibe the of the yeah. city. The you hot know? dog. Is it a good way to get to know a place? <laughs> they pour out the relish, David, and they start like mixing it around on I the see, table. I uh, see roast beef in your future. <laughs> Do you know what makes New York psychics better, in my opinion? What the, the water? The water. Oh, oh. That, that that good water. Yeah. It's that good <laughs> New York water. It's that hard water. Uh, hard water. I did like one of those walk up like. It, 
psychics where they have the neon sign in the window in the second story of some building once with my friend. And the only thing I remember her telling me is that it's going to take a long time before I get married. Mm, that one's haunted me. But now, That's but now, I mean. now I'm like, it, is that because exactly she now you're doing what Kate Blanchett is like, how you end up with four kids. Yeah. This is why I'm never going to get married, by the way. Just because I want to prove her wrong. Yeah. I like that her cards are total nonsense because Remy was like, I don't want this to be rooted in anything, you know, like tarot or anything like that. She should just have weird symbols that like she clearly knows what they mean, she, but it's Isn't it a game? Is it not that game? They're the Ghostbusters cards. No, they but, are no, the cards that Bill Murray uses at the but they also, psyching test. The they? wavy lines, the square, the circle. Yeah. He they just calls like, them bland, meaningless symbols. That is, but there's he was also insistent. A game that was up with Dr. Peter Vankin. set. It also looks like the set get cards. Oh, I sure. mean, sure. Like there are repetitive, like it's like circles and squiggles and stuff. But like, I you do, know. I like that aspect of it. That Raimi was like, you develop your own internal system. Exactly, I just want right. to be able to shoot you and go. But like, I don't want to have to do a close up of like a hangman or whatever. Yeah, I mean, um, there's definitely a movie I I would want to see with about that yeah. psychic. It's just. It keeps pulling away from it. Uh, just to be clear, like, Bill about Thornton's childhood was his parents were still together, but his mother was operating as a psychic out of their living room. And he was like, there was that weird vibe of, like, we had magazines sitting on our table like it was a dentist's office. People would wait for their reading. And, like, the guy who says he's bleeding but doesn't want to go to a doctor is, like, a thing that Thornton that, pulled that from. That was a real guy that right. she would see. Uh, His mother never got roped up in a murder mystery, but it's more the know. idea of. Yeah. But you want more of that, too. Like yes, I, you want more yeah, of I want regular s- customers. Yes. Yeah. Like, it, even, it, it would have helped so much to have just a, even a sprinkling in right. of that. And then, look, the other thing I find kind of interesting in this movie is that we're t- we failed to talk about the other great supporting character actor performance in this movie, which is, of course, Michael Jeter Who as the great. prosecution. And when's he bad? Never. Obviously, we've talked about Michael Jeter on this podcast before. Weirdly on the Polar Express on Polar episode Express, when we yeah. dove deep into Michael Jeter. Yeah. Have you ever seen him in... He's in Fisher King, right? Yes. He is mm. so good so in good. The Fisher King. and but He's really always good. He really is. This isn't the kind of thing you'd think he'd excel at. No, and you'd almost figure him to play the cop or whatever, like right. to play the J.K. Simmons role. Right. But he's so good in this. And Do you think J.K. Simmons saw him and was like, you the fucker has been stealing my role for 10 years? Anyway, sorry. <laughs> and Raimi's like, I've been telling you, J.K., uh, grow, mustache, grow out the right? mustache an like, additional I I it, two yeah. inches. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> J.K.'s looking, his mustache is a little thin in this one. Jeter's always got a full push bro. He does. He's got but, a great mustache. Um, the Jeter scene is the other thing this movie is kind of interesting with regards to that it doesn't, I think, explore enough or I guess maybe compellingly enough, which is this like, so in order to accept this evidence, you have to buy into the idea that the supernatural is real and this like question Th- that whole of sequence integrity. feels like another movie. Yeah. yeah. It's somewhat interesting, but it's not long enough. No. Yeah. But also I literally was just like, why is she on the stand? <laughs> right. They should just be like, he has a reputation for violence yeah. Yeah. and we found a dead body in his fucking backyard. Right. Yeah. Convict, like right. that's, yeah. they don't need and to so they're like, bring in a psychic who's so like, you're well. telling me you're magical. <laughs> yeah, and your also, husband died. I'm it, like, this is devastating yeah. for the case. Also, yeah. the fucking judge is like sustaining, right? When yeah. like uh, uh, Keanu's saying like fuck and being like so right. fucking crude, right. and he's like telling the lawyer to like be quiet, and then also when. Um, she's getting cross-examined. He is saying some of the most wretched, horrible things. Right. He's to like, her. "I do hate witches. Why don't you shut your whore mouth?" <laughs> it's like fucking crazy. It's yeah. like stenographer is like a uh, whore, H O R, a whore mouth. Okay. The stenographer also. Did you see this? Like the the stenographer. There was not quality control on that background acting because no. she was she's so prominently displayed in the scene and she's typing so elaborately over the key. It's very distracting. If you want you see her she becomes the the star of the scene i do and that made me feel like sam raimi wasn't even on set that day i do wonder and look it's maybe a convenient excuse but i do wonder if like he gets spider-man halfway through filming this yes. movie i do wonder if at certain points in the production of this film he's just starting to daydream spider-man more than he is paying attention to what's I happening i swear Impossible. that's the only thing to expl- you should re-watch the stenographer that's the only th- now knowing that he got Spider-Man is means that that scene now makes sense. To right, me. you're just like he's just like there was no direct. I mean, so but imagine being in the mental state of that. Imagine I, having to finish this film knowing what's coming. No, I can't. Ron, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, a couple other things. You mentioned Paxton was the first choice. Yeah, 
Ron Eldard was the second choice. Who's one of those guys where it was like he was in things for a second. Yes. I don't want to be rude about a guy who might be a nice guy. Uh-huh. He's a horrible actor. He's he gives one of the most ru- movie ruining performances I've ever seen in um which one uh, the House, House of, of Sand, Sand and Fog. Fog. Yes. One of those things where when he walks in, you're like, oh, who's this? In five minutes, and you're like, well, movie ruined. Why? Well, this sucks. <laughs> Obviously, he's part of a bad storyline. Yes, but, but he he's really bad. Stick. Yes. He was in ER, which J- is J.J. Abrams really... takes him off the bench weirdly for Super 8, and then like he does the old Eldar shit, and it kind of fucks up the movie again. It's He's bad in Super 8, and that could be good. I know. He's, I, I think that I was mostly supposed to be Renner? Him because he plays an absolutely horrible character in ER okay. in season 2 of ER. He's the weird boyfriend or love interest in uh, Drop Dead Fred. Yes, that's right. Way back when, uh, he did, didn't he that's do like a, his first didn't role? Didn't do basically. a blind lawyer show. Didn't he do a show that was literally called Blind Justice? That was Rutger Hauer. The, the, oh, that's Blind Fury. That's uh, the you are correct that he did a show called Blind Justice. It's like Daredevil, but what if he's not a superhero? And yes, he he is a blind policeman. Oh right, he would blind go to detective. the scene of the crime and he would see things that no one else could. <sighs> it was a, it was a Stephen Bochco. Like, because there's a lot of Stephen Bochco shows that people don't remember, right? Yeah. You know, like you know, and that's one of them. Yeah, it ran for 13 episodes. Had a notorious show killer Rena Sofer in it, and mm. Frank Grillo. Grillo. Love Gerlo. And Michael Gaston and Saul Rubinick? That sounds like a canceled cop show from the 90s. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Kinnear, the third choice. You know, there was the classic, like, can we really cast Talk Soup's Greg Kinnear? Right. But then they did. Could, could, um, could Paxton not do it? Is that why he wasn't I in it? Would ass- I would yeah. assume, like, he's actually busy. There was something. I think I saw whatever the specific project was. Um, yeah, but yeah. But yes, as we mentioned, he. It's a real leap, uh, it's a real leap between the two. Like, from Paxton with that, what's his name? El. The Eldard. Eldard. But like, Eldard, Eldard is one of those guys where people are like, this is a guy, right? Like, right. I don't know he's, why. He's not higher than Greg Kinnear? He, uh, in his... I think it was just because Kinnear was so light at that yes. point in time. Like, even though he's working to cast off the talk soup thing, it's also like his legitimate movies have been Sabrina, As Good As It Gets, and You've Got Mail, which are all like a very like light tone of geniality. But as Good As It Gets is before this? Yeah. So he's got the Oscar nomination, but he still hasn't done a movie where he's like serious. That's what I mean. How can this be the serious? That's it's what I insane. Mean. That's what I'm saying. It's insane. Like, listen to what you're, the yes. words coming no, out of I your know. mouth. That they're like. <laughs> Do you hear the words coming out <laughs> of your mouth? He has not yet done the, the level of serious that the gift But I truly is. think that was the thought can where you, they were like, Kinnear can be charming, sure. Yeah. But can he yeah. play like a real guy? But the whole but thing is, like, this run is, of, is serious. You've got male mystery men, Nurse Betty, and Loser, which are the four movies in between. It's a good this run, actually. Well, it's a run of interesting movies that he is always playing the same part, which is like, you think he's nice, and it actually turns Smarmy out he's asshole. a jerk. Yeah. Right. And like, he's so good, mystery man. He is very well cast in mystery. That fucking it's a small scene, role, but he's so yeah. Funny. But but the, the one, scene where he just sort of lays out everything that's going to yeah, happen. Here's to what him. I'm thinking: flip the script. <laughs> He's is it perfect? Fun. No, but I think that's why I like it. Uh, I just, sorry, I, I, I really, have his entire performance committed. To my mind. <laughs> After this, of course, he gets autofocus and he's like, finally, Oscar's coming for Kinnear. Yeah, let I me think, jerk off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, as we mentioned, Sam Raimi found out he was directing Spider-Man in the middle of filming this movie. Yeah. Um, hands Rosemary Harris a golden ticket. Hands J.K. Simmons I, a golden ticket. Says we haven't mentioned months. it. I do like the Rosemary Harris scene. It's kind of sweet. I kind of evocative. You do understand how he on set that day watching her deliver that dialogue uh, straight in the camera goes, little Aunt May vibe here. Yes. Um, this works. I could yeah. carry this as, over. As you say, composer Christopher Young was like, yeah, he was uh, pretty busy <laughs> like, while right. I was uh, doing We had like road. one meeting where he was like, look, I know you can do all the supernatural scary stuff. I want you to write a score for the emotional journey of this character, this woman yeah. finding peace at the end of her grieving process, right. which I... I, I don't think that emotional narrative tracks very well across the movie. Uh, well, but, and, I agree with that. And definitely not the ending note of it. It's the, not the closure. It's not a grave. movie like The Descent where I'm like, oh, this like supernatural movie, this horror film at the end you realize has been a film about coming to terms with grief or Babadook or whatever the fuck. Like, sure. I just feel like I forget at certain times her internal journey. But it's because of the shaming part. It's just be- yes. It's because like I just feel like I, I, I don't like how they don't allow – it seems like it's being decided not by her when her journey gets She to puts her, her head on Greg Gineer's chest an hour and 15 minutes in, and you're like, she should have been having a developing relationship with Greg Gineer 30 minutes in. Yes. Right. 
Uh, but obviously, he was married. He was engaged to Katie Holmes. No, but once he's Whatever. single, very once the body, one, yeah. no, but once he's sing, his wife is dead and she's they're both single. She still says, "I can't do it because you're not over her husband yet." Yeah. And then you're like, "Oh my god!" I'm, this whole movie is just been me watching a woman grieving for her husband. That's the A storyline, and everything I, else is incidental around it. I and I, and as much as I think Blanchett is like pretty solid in this movie, yeah. the character just doesn't. Really it's pretty mix. one note like that stuff, and it just doesn't move on from it. Okay. She doesn't transcend it. She doesn't. No, fuck well, no it up, one's really he, transcending anything. In can this we movie. Sh- can we talk about this movie's odd ending, the Buddy Cole ending? Please. Yeah. Buddy Cole, of course, is the character played by Giovanni Ribisi, who we've sort of talked around. Yeah. Who is a mentally ill person who comes to Annie for readings a lot, but is like super disturbed. She's he keeps on saying she's like his only friend. Right. And you're worried, like, is this a thing where he's like in love with her and doesn't have boundaries? And of course you're like, who's gonna be the bad guy? Is it gonna be this guy? Like, you right, because like, he's clearly on edge and he has these sort of like or breakdowns. How's he gonna do with mice of men moment? What he, right. I, I don't it's not like I don't think he's gonna be the bad guy. I think he's gonna like not have impulse control and mess it and mess it's something also, up and be it's also one of those things where, like, unlike Sling Blade, where you're like, this is such a good performance. I know exactly who this guy is and what his level of functionality is. This is a performance of such actorly, like, tricks mm-hmm. that you're like, what level of competency and functionality is this guy supposed to be at? Yeah. Because I'm not concerned for him. I'm just aware of how much Giovanni Ribisi is doing. Yes. To show us that he's disturbed. Yes, this vague catch-all of Disturbed. Right, and he keeps on talking about staring into the blue diamond and how it's going to fuck him up forever. Is, is it, I thought it was the eye? Is it diamond? No, yeah, blue diamond. Blue diamond, blue diamond. Right. It yeah, ends yeah, up yeah. being tattooed, belly tattooed, tattooed on, on his, his father's belly father. Button, which is a really nasty and stupid twist. It's, quote unquote. it's horrible. But the like, there's thing. this moment where she's kind of like, you know what, just do whatever. You know, she's distracted and she basically blows him off. Oh, because he has that confession where he comes to her and he's crying hysterically and he's like, I keep touching myself and masturbating. He like shows think of my up father. at the courthouse basically. Like, she's right. basically like, got, just gotten off the stand and he, there's yeah. Buddy he's like, outside quick, being like, I need to talk to you right now. Quick right question. Now. Why do I do uncomfortable things when I think of my dad? And she's like, I don't know. And he's like, let me make it really clear for you. I think <laughs> of my father and then I masturbate. Meanwhile, yeah. there's the townspeople being like, witch, yeah. witch. Fuck you. But she does really drop the ball on that. Like She, she is obviously so does, but she's, yes. you know, we sort of, we get that she is besieged right. with stuff or whatever and she blows him off and then he snaps and ties his dad to a chair and right. sets the him on fire. Right, calls her yeah. Yeah. outside the trailer. But- he's duct taped his father. He's whipping his father with a belt. It's a really unpleasant scene. It's a very unpleasant scene that does not just just doesn't particularly feel earned. It more feels like kind of this like ghastly twist. Yes. And then he's sent to a mental institution. But of course, in the end of the movie, Mm -hmm. he magically appears and saves her. Yes. When she's being attacked by the vicious, super strong and super intimidating Greg Kinnear. The iconic weapon of the flashlight. Yes. Uh, But no, he saves her. Yes. And she's like, he saved me. And then you got the classic like. Ma'am, he hasn't been alive in yeah. 30 years. You know, yeah. it's, he died at the mental institution yesterday. Right. You say he saved you at 9 p.m., but Buddy <laughs> Cole died at 6 p.m. It really is that specific, too. Because yes. they say, all they say is that he hung himself tonight. And I'm like, well, he if you don't give a time stamp on that, he could have saved her and right. then hung himself. Right. And he had a friggin' blanket. Uh, that he, he washed. did have a wash handkerchief, cloth. little handkerchief. Oh, yeah. little, we didn't have time to tri- wash the blanket. No, it's what she gave in the beginning. Him Right, when he's crying. At the car, when she gets her car fixed. Right, he slams on the brakes and starts crying. sweating, something. I don't know why she gives it to him. Right, but it's it's like a baby, like, throw-up blanket, right? Yeah. And then he washes it, gives it back to her, and then the fact that she has it in her pocket is proof that somehow something supernatural happened. I don't fucking know. I don't know. Or is it, or is it more like um, the Kate Blanchett and the four kids? Maybe she's like always had that in her pocket, then she takes it out to t- make herself feel like it's proof. I, I just wish Giovanni, Giovanni Ribisi's character was not in this movie at all. Do you think you, I, could, I, so, you could almost lift him out? I mean, Grandma shows up and saves the day. That would have been the better. Well, movie. Yeah. The, thing is, the thing is, because he <laughs> keeps got her, being. Yeah. He's in his own movie. His character's always just yes. with her. So it means... It, it, it means it, nothing it, it, other you, than him saving her at the end and then this twist that is sort of like, okay, fucking whatever. This is a year after Sixth Sense. I don't fucking need yeah, this. Yeah, and it doesn't... And it extra doesn't land because because they've been separated right. too. Like it's, not only has it been done a million times... A it's truly just, hokey and bad ending would be her husband saving her. Yes. They they didn't do that. No. I don't think they should do that. No. But it's almost weirder that it's like, remember that guy that you... Kind of kind too, but you also kind of weren't that helpful. 
At the end of the day, he came and helped you. And I'm like, why? Who you, cares? You truly? And also, he kind of sucks yeah. too. Like the he thing sucks. is, these, he's not these, a good these, character. These, this whole movie's about toxic masculinity. I know yeah. it's an overused term, but it is like if there ever is a movie about that, there these guys the, are the bad. The violence impulses impulses of men. Are yeah. with I mean, they're just like yes. they're really over the top. Yes. In, in, in why they are bad. Every movies. man wants to like fuck you and kill you. And yeah. like you say, Kate Blanchett is saintly in this kind of a way of like, well, I'm just a single mom trying to make ends meet and I don't have time for romance and I don't have time for, you yeah. know, and I want to be friends to, you know. Yeah. To this guy who like really ring. violently oh, tried no. to kill. Fuck, wait a second. David's wedding ring mysteriously. I mean, I fiddled. No, I took it off. I fiddled with my wedding ring. All mysteriously. The time. Um, do, you, do we think. David, at, check your at, hoodie at, pocket quickly. <laughs> Oh my God! There's a throw-up blanket. In there. <laughs> I mean, that Sorry. used to be very true yeah, in my wor- life. Where are you saying shortly? <laughs> no, just at their peak is Giovanni Ribisi against Ben Foster at their very best performances. Who's better? Foster. <sighs> I think Foster at his best. Foster? Foster has given performances that I really, really love. But, I agree. But, but, okay, okay, no more but, like this. But Foster you gotta in put this the bad, mode you, drives me equally. That's what I was crazy. gonna say. Got, okay, no more curve. We got to do a curve. We got to factor in the bad, the best, and the worst. Yeah. What does it average out to? Who's better? Then. I think we're BC. Wow, but then you do Foster, have the other sister. <laughs> you have a couple right at the bottom, really dragging the average down. But Foster, when he's like this, irritates me more. Uh, hmm, I agree. Here's what I'll say: Rabisi actually has a stronger middle ground. I don't know if in Ted. Like funny. This is the thing. Like when he does the Seth MacFarlane shit, he's funny. Is mm. Foster ever funny? That. Guy doesn't me as someone, someone who can who be does funny. Funny. I no. met him once, and he was exactly yes. At 10. Yes. Yes. I, I have had a similar interaction yes. with him. No, I, I'm not hinting at anything on tour, but yeah. you're just like walks He's into a, a bar super and you're like, okay, I've just too much. Foster. Too much. Like yes. him in party mode is too much. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, I think Foster has no middle ground. I think shit like Hell or High Water, you're like, he's phenomenal in this. He's and shit so like 310 to Yuma, I'm like, take it down. 310 to Yuma, it's too much. I do like him in The Messenger, although it's a lot. Great man. Um, ben Foster, I'm, go. Like, it, terrible in fucking, like, Warcraft. But I think Rabisi has... Yeah, like couldn't be on, he couldn't be on Friends Warcraft. either. You can't... No, Rabisi has a middle zone that's better, but Rabisi's worse is maybe worse, and his best is maybe not as good as Foster's best. I think... It's Rabisi, an interesting comparison. I think Rabisi, at his worst, is worse acting, but Ben Foster at his worst drives me more crazy. It bugs me more. That's true. I Yeah, I feel almost mean about Rabisi now because I do think... I like him in plenty of movies. I can say, like, and he can be quite six performances subtle. I like from him. Yes, uh, and he was so sneaky. As sne- I've never seen sneaky. I will. No sneaky Pete sneaky. Brian Cranston produced. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he's in the pilot, so I, I think that was a very good, in good faith, absolutely show to, to take on. But like Foster but, could not do Sneaky Pete. No, and I think I mean, everyone watched Sneaky Pete. I mean, I've never like, seen Sneaky fine. Pete. Yeah, this is the point. You he's haven't sneaky. been keeping up with Pete and his sneakiness. It's hard to keep up he's, with him. He keeps on sneaking away. <laughs> what if that was the problem? Amazon was like, we try to put him on the homepage, but he's, he's so sneaky. <laughs> it's not that our UI is bad. It's this piece he's too sneaking sneaky. around, he's hiding in family friendly, you know, <laughs> princess movies. What's he doing over there? I guess I. I, I don't think I'm ever upset if a Giovanni Ribisi movie comes on. No, and once again, every I find this performance incredibly upsetting in its own way, but I also go like, I feel bad that they let him do this. Whereas Foster, I'm like, you should have known better. Because it's after, it's post this, too. Yeah. Like, a yeah. world, acting like this in a post-GIF world, Right. I, there's more points taken off. David. Yeah. And this needs to be read verbatim, so please listen to me closely. I'm listening so closely. Bombus's mission is simple. Colon. Make the most comfortable clothes ever and match every item sold with an equal item donated. So when you buy Bombus, you are also giving to someone in need. <laughs> Thank you for reading that verbatim. And that that's a gift. See, this is where I should have saved the uh, some gifts are a curse. Because Bombus is a gift is a gift. You buy an item, they gift an item to someone in need. It's a really nice thing about Bombas. And look, it'd be one thing if they were given bad gifts. It would be one thing. We would still appreciate the effort. Yeah, but that Bombas, they designed these things, socks, shirts, underwear, to be clothes you can't wait to put on every day. This is the thing. They actually decided to make the best items possible. It's soft, seamless, tagless with a luxuriously cozy feel. Hmm. Good idea by them. Super soft materials like merino wool and pima cotton and cashmere. To smart. make it really cozy. Yeah. Pretty smart. Pretty smart. Maybe you want a performance style. 
Maybe you'll want something more comfy. They've got all kinds of stuff. David, are you going to wear performance style socks at our live show? I guess so. I'm definitely going to wear Bombas because you're going to have to perform. Yeah, you got. That's well, a good yes. point. This yes, is my yeah. point. Yeah, I'm going to wear Bombas, Bombas briefs, Bombas socks, a Bombas shirt. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Go all Bombas. May I might go all Bombas. Look, their T-shirts have thoughtful design features like invisible seams and soft pa- Ooh, fabrics. Baby. Ooh. The underwear has a barely there feel with second skin support that might yeah. make you forget that you're even there, even there in a good way. Good. And of course. As you said, socks, underwear, and t-shirts, the three most requested clothing items at homeless shelters. That's why Bombas donates one for every item you buy. Pretty nice. And also, obviously, and they always are too modest to mention this, Bombas is the most successful product in the history of Shark Tank. Yes, of course. Listen, go to bombas.com slash check and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash check for 20% off. Bombas.com slash check. The gift was given a limited qualifying release on mm-hmm. December 22nd, 2000. We will not be doing that box office no. game. Because wide that is release. the castaway oh, wow. mm-hmm. release. Okay. We will do its wide release, which was on January 19th of 2001. Okay. Um, it grossed $12 million against a $9 million budget. Okay. Another 32 internationally. If not it, good, but no. not. If like, they had it, figured out how to monetize screen grabs of nude scenes, this movie would have gone into profit ten times over. But in fact, they could right. not. Right, they, lo- they lost all. That I was going to say before. The, or whatever. Did, did Sam Raimi uh, do, do his uh, like submit his, throw his name to the hat before the gift was even made? Yes, yeah. yes, because Spider Man has been gestating for so long. Right. Yeah, he pitched on that. I would imagine in the late nineties or whatever. I think Initially. it was. I think it was ninety nine, yeah, yeah. and then they hire him in two thousand when he's yeah. filming this movie. He makes and it in two thousand and one, and when did it come out? Two thousand two. There you go. It was supposed to come out in two thousand one, yeah. and people thought it was because and of nine eleven. Then to Rex Reed's Fury, they released it in May of two thousand two. We will discuss that on the next. No, episode. they thought it was because of nine eleven because of the weird teaser trailer, and it right. was that they started making the movie, and they were like, "How long does?" Uh, CGI take I mean, a couple of days. Come right. on, he swings. It truly was that like foreign to them that they were like, "Oh, this movie's gonna take a year longer to finish than we assumed." Um, this movie, the gift probably shouldn't have come out until after Spider Man, based on Sony paying Paramount to delay it. Mm-hmm. But Spider Man took so long to finish, understandably, that it ended up coming out a year earlier. When you hear Sam Raimi talk about the Par- Paramount classics in the interviews too, I like that he says, I don't really understand it myself. It's so funny. He's like, there's like Paramount kind of wants it, but they know that they don't know how to market something that's this small. And there's this guy Lakeshore and he's willing to put up 90% of the money. Paramount puts up the 10. So then when it's on home video and cable, it's Paramount. But then they hand it off to the smaller thing. He's like, I don't yeah. know. They're going to put it in theaters. Who gives a shit? Yeah. Which they and I do. like that he's just like, it doesn't, it, you think it makes sense to me? It does not. But right. it, it never expands beyond like 800 screens. Like sure. it never really got like a super It is release. surprising. I do think it's surprising that it wasn't a hit given how much the actors inside still thought this this kind of it's, movie had not been made it enough. It's kind of a perfect January thriller and like it should have made the watcher money. Yeah. Right. It should have made right more like 30 to 40. Right. And it makes 12. It didn't get particularly good reviews and I think it was saddled with this had Oscar buzz energy, yes. right? Yes. Like where it was given an awardsy release. Except that didn't work. It was actually taken out of theaters for a couple of weeks. Right. Like, you know, it was only a tiny release. Sure. And then like, then they were like, well, here you go, the gift. Yeah. And I feel like already it was just kind of like, well, we're moving on. Mm-hmm. Because what was number one at the box office that week, Griffin? You're pointing at me. Uh, he wouldn't know. Uh, January 19th, mm-hmm. 2001. Mm-hmm. This is a film for teens. It was number one the week before. It's one of those movies that was a big deal at the time, was a hit. I feel like it's mostly forgotten hmm. these days. It's a January release. It's not a December holdover. No, it's a January release. Solidly for teens. It's a teen film. What genre? Teen. Ah, it's going to give it away. Dance. Oh, it's Save the Last Dance. It's Save the Last a, a Dance. Big ass hit. Yeah. Huge hit. Huge yeah. hit. Made ninety million dollars. Not forgotten. In January. I, that's not for that movie is not forgotten. Yeah, I see. I'm Julia, put that back Julia, Julia Stiles is right. that clip is surfaces all the time. Yeah. I think that movie is a little forgotten. It's but not, in that clip you're talking about, yes, you're right. People might not have not I don't think they've watched that film, but they definitely know what that is. I and think they're very you can familiar make a with, reference to it and it will not fall upon a single deaf ear. Yeah. Yes. Whether it's visual or whatever. And, sh- yeah. and it's made her a bigger star now than I feel like 
it may, she's lasted longer in people's memory than I would have thought. It is because funny of that film. The 10 things I hate about you was like, we're telling you these are the next two stars. And then the movie over underperforms a little bit. And then they were like, okay, Julia Stiles, make a dance movie. She makes a dance movie. That movie overperforms. Everyone's like, I guess you were right. Julia Stiles is the person. Mm -hmm. And then she kind of just gets stuck into like, you talk to Jason Bourne over the phone. Mm -hmm. uh, she sure does. I mean, I was the biggest Styles fan. I like her a lot. Yeah. Still like her. Like her if she pops up in a Hustlers or whatever. Always right? happy. You know, always happy to uh, see her. Uh, Silver Lines Playbook, she's very good. In. Yeah, that's right. Damn. Yeah. yeah. Weirdly good sister that. casting. Yeah. J Law. Um, number two at the box office is a gigantic hit film that I recently mentioned. It's in its fifth week. No, no, this is 2001. Castaway? Cast yes, Castaway. Thank there you. you. Go. Fifth week. It's made $181 million. A uh, huge ass. Big old hit. Now, number three at the box office is an Oscar holdover mm -hmm. that's more in a chugging along zone. Mm. It's made $46 million in a month. It's going to make 124 Wow. So it's And it's not going to make that by suddenly exploding. It just chugs traffic? for ages. Traffic. Yeah. Wow. Here's the thing with traffic. Yeah. Is it a good movie? I don't know. Because the whole thing with traffic is it's made by one of America's great filmmakers. Yes. It's the thing it's the that gets him the Oscar. Best director. For. Yeah. It's got a transformative performance by Benicio Del Toro that I think everyone can still agree. Like, yeah. what a great performance, yeah. right? Half of it feels kind of hacky and lame now, yeah. right? The drug stuff is really, really, like, it, it has not time to well. But also it because, well. like, in the 20 years since, there were so many movies made about the drug trade that, yeah. you know, got into it in more detail, right? Like, but before that, it was a Like, lot just less. the way that she gets hooked on drugs, it's so after I mean, school right, special. But, like, compared to Breaking has, Bad or whatever, yeah. Is it the traffic has what? You know, the Del Toro story is very mm -hmm. good. Yeah. The Cheadle story, I think, is almost underrated. I think he's amazing well, in that Cheadle movie. Is a fucking bad right. Story. And then the and then it's just that the Michael Douglas, Erica Christensen story is yeah. is the one that's kind of glaring and clunky. I just think it's funny. I haven't seen it in a while. Well, that's it seems like a movie to, to revisit. It's yeah. a, it's it it seems like the kind of, it could go either way. I've seen it one time. I probably saw it in 2004, 2005 on cable. Uh I didn't see it when it came out, and I just remember being like this movie is so fucking bracing and real and intelligent and it's got so much fucking integrity. You won't believe how fucking good this thing is. And everyone was just saying like, well, Soderbergh obviously should win Best Director for Traffic, but it's never going to happen. It's too cool. It's too edgy. And there was too he'll good. split the vote. He'll split and, the vote. Yeah. Aaron Brockovich was the bigger hit. and It's the populist right. one. Angley's going to get it. And when he won for Traffic, it was this like, fuck yeah. Like, right. yes. And absolutely. now they we're made the like, right huh, call. he won for Traffic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and like that whole movie feels a little bit like hokey. And everywhere you're using to describe it is the kind of movie that when you go back, you're like, we were so, we, I can't believe we thought this bad about that, this the, movie. The other thing is, I think at the time people were like, he did this thing that is so ingenious. The movie has multiple plot lines that take place in different countries, and for each one, he picks a different color filter. <laughs> Which and now, right. it's yeah. the most overused shit in right. the world it's now. It's quite a yeah. trope. Right. right. I don't but mind, also, but those kind of movies, I can always factor in if it's overused after. Yes. It's more like, I, need, I still need it to have something going for it. Like, I need it to transcend the kind of, the breathless Absolutely. way we describe it. If it's, because I, I can always be like, I, I've seen this a million times after. I just think right. when I watched it in 2004, 2005, and I was like, I now finally am going to watch what is clearly Steven Soderbergh's masterpiece as everyone has presented it to me. I was like, oh, okay. I think it's a so good what movie. Did you, I haven't seen it in a long time. Did you time. like it? I liked. I was like, this you is fine. I'm a little time. surprised that people were this rhapsodic about it. But it is also, it's a two and a half hour film about the drug trade that made $124 million. Dollars, it. Won four Oscars. Yeah. It is wild. And then right after that, he's like, should I make like a heist movie <laughs> that like redefines the genre forever and I mean, launches a million movie it's stars? Just those? But, but that's everything Sam Raimi wants to be. Absolutely. Sam Raimi, the fact that Soderbergh can make the most commercial fun films of all time and make the real ones. In an 18 see. month span, he did Aaron Brockovich, Traffic, Ocean's Eleven, all three films. Oh, don't forget Full Frontal. That's in that's there, a, too. Isn't that right after? Might be 2000. That's what I'm saying. It's those three happened in a row. We're all huge-ass fucking hits. Yeah, no, it is a crazy And getting crazy to throw crazy. the adult movie. If it's Soderbergh's just like, I just feel like making an adult movie for a second. And then pulling right. it off is... Right. Th that's what kept Sam Raimi up at night. Yes. Knowing Look, that that kind of thing it, existed. It's hard to be Steven Soderbergh. Not a lot of people have pulled that off. No. I can only think of one. Big old Sody. Yeah. Sody Pop.
Yep, mm. Canna, Canna Sodi. Okay, number four at the box office is a crime comedy mm. uh, that I think is expanding this week, maybe or something like, um, and is uh, becomes a bit of a sleeper hit mm-hmm. off of a prior sleeper sleep sleepier hit. <laughs> I mm, anything I say about this movie will both invoke. It's a sleeper hit off a prior sleepier hit. From the same director? Same, that's the same director. Okay. So it's him being like, what if I bit. did the thing I did in my debut film again, but with a couple movie stars this time? Mm-hmm. But apart from that, it's the same vibe. It is a sequel or not. It's just it's another not a sequel. It's just, yeah. But it really is like the next movie by this guy. It's going to be vibe. The, the fancier version. More money. Right. He's the got, higher thread count. Can you tell us what genre that is? It's crime. crime. It's a crime. crime you know, comedy, but like dark comedy. In January 2000, I'll tell you this. Yeah. David Sims, where mm. he lived, these mm. films were inescapably This huge. movie's called Snatch. Called Snatch. Oh. Um, yeah. I mean, the minute I bring up that he's British, my, uh, my, hey, yeah, box, give it away. Ain't it. But I feel like Lockstock, yes. in Britain, it was like the most important film of the year. In America, it was like, huh. Some British crime movie has a little bit of juice. Uh, I will say to you, it didn't land as hard, but the marketing of the movie was like, you need to understand this is the most important film in England. It, it was, and it was very much this sort of, there was a big kind of like, this is the next Tarantino I remember thing. there being a lot of ads on MTV. Like they were specifically trying to convince teenagers, you don't know how cool this movie is. And then the Snatch UK just flipped out. It's truly him just being like, same vibes, same cast, throwing Brad Pitt, throwing Del Toro. Yeah. But what's it about? Oh, it's a bit. It's a little bit. It's a diamond. You know, it's just a bunch of fucking Velcro. nonsense. Yeah, and I'm 14 years old, and I liked Snatch, but there were just people in my life who were like, "There's pre-Snatch and there's post-Snatch," for me. <laughs> right? You know, like they were just like, "This has changed my life." People had been snatched. I've never seen a man in a pork pie hat punch someone and say like, "Lovely jubbly," you know. <laughs> And now that's how I want to live that my is, life. Like, that that's is, what I want to do. <laughs> that is an incredible summation of Guy Ritchie movies. A guy in a pork pie hat punches somebody and says, lovely jubbly. That is... Because yes, that's correct. The thing, that is the whole vibe. Yeah. And then underneath it is like some fucking Paul Oakenfeld remix of a soul song from and, the same And the camera's cutting. And right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Snatch. Snatch. Have you seen Snatch? No, I never have. What? You've I never know. seen Snatch? Never have you seen Lockstock? Snatch. I don't think I've ever. So you, like, you never Sherlock saw a Holmes? Guy Ritchie movie before he got to Hollywood, essentially. Yeah. Where's my pork? I'm, I'm going to punch you. <laughs> Snatch isn't considered him getting. No, but Snatch is him getting to Hollywood if Brad Pitt's in it. Brad Pitt is in it, and it was a Sony movie, but like, you know. It was it was a bridge. It was in between the it's two. It's still like a, a, a yeah. British film. Hope but he's up. not a good filmmaker, right? I mean, I think that The Man from Uncle is like the best kind of Hollywood movie that he can make, yes, right? Agreed. Where it's like the right level of yeah. glitz and silliness. Not a fan of the Sherlock movies. No. I don't love the Sherlocks. Uh, and I do feel like his post Hollywood Brit movies, Rock and Roll of the Gentleman, yeah. always kind of feel like he's, you know, same bag of tricks, but it's sort of like we've been here before. You know, like yes. they never, some people will stick up for Rock and Roll. Because Gerard Butler of it all, or whatever. But those movies aren't what Rock and Roll Hell arguably is. I agree with that. Yeah, and and I think and I find his Hollywood stuff mostly anonymous. But mm-hmm. I, King, King Arthur's got stuff. You always fucking stand. <laughs> it's got stuff. You stuff. stand up for King Arthur. Yeah. What's number five at the box office? Yeah. It's a film we covered on this podcast. It's a romantic comedy. It's a romantic comedy from the year 2000 that we covered on this podcast. It is, it's a 2000 holdover? It sure is, and it's made $162 million. It's is called it What Ephron? Women Want. That's right, Nancy Myers. It's What Women Want. It was up until? It was What Women Wanted. It, well, I was going to say, until Big Fat Greek <laughs> Wedding, that was the highest grossing romantic comedy of all time mm-hmm. in the United States of America. Well, wow. Women Wanted. That. Do you remember when we learned what uh, men want? <laughs> Honestly, I had forgotten, but yes, we did see what men you want. You forgot a perfect film directed by Adam Shankman, my favorite director. Of course. <laughs> um, some other films in the top 10. Finding mm-hmm. Forrester, mm-hmm. You Are the Man Now, Doc. Uh, Miss Congeniality, a very charming film. Sandy Bullock. Mm-hmm. I can't remember the setup, but I the other day I made a good You're the Dog Now Man joke. And it was it worked. 
I'm glad for you. The context worked where suddenly it was the only correct thing to say, and I said it at the right time, and I'm not asking for comedy points. I just, nope. attention must be paid. I don't have any yeah. bones on me, but um, I would give you a bone. You. There is There's also the Crouching Mall Tiger, Man. Hidden Dragon. Only made $37 million so far, so it's also got a long way to go. Oh, it's starting? It, it's has, not, it hasn't already done the run? Well, it's, they're like, can you been believe out for this two movie months has made $37 million? Dollars. Exactly. Right, they're like, what a huge hit. And then it's going to make another $100 million. Uh, there's 13 Days, a very solid dad movie with Cosner yeah. uh, about JFK. and the uh, Yes, but, but also very Part much... Of this JFK kink. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. like a post for love of game. Kink, like, Kevin, not. you don't get to be... The guy in a movie at that size exerting this much control again. Mm. You now have a January Cuban Missile Crisis. That's true. That's true. I mean, I do think 13 Days got a limited awards release, I will say. People thought Greenwood maybe had a shot. Greenwood's great in that movie. He's a great actor. Uh, He is a great actor. Feels Um, like he should have been in The Gift. He would have been good at the Greg Kinnear part. Sure. Why not? Hey. Right? He's got the edge. Now... 2001 also in number 10, of course, is the well-remembered Orlando Jones, Eddie Griffin Double team. buddy movie, Double Take. Uh, Double Take. Uh, that movie came out uh, on a weekend that I think overlapped with my brother's birthday. Mm. And my mother felt bad that she had not planned anything for my brother's birthday. And she was like, what do you want to do? And James was like, I want to see Double Take, which I also want to see because we are both all in on Orlando Jones as the 7-Up guy. Sure. And 40 minutes into the movie, my mom was like, I, I cannot I take this. I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, I know it's your birthday. <laughs> look me in the eyes. Doesn't seem very good. Look me in the eyes and tell me you're enjoying this. <laughs> so we <laughs> walked out of it and watched the second half of Emperor's New Groove, which we had already seen. Double uh, take. So I love, but that, but the walking out of the theater into the other theater, that's yeah. a good birthday. It was great. Double take One also, I remember. movies were on the poster, there's a dog, and you're like, they're really, they think they're in trouble. They're like, can we put a funny dog on the poster or something? Like, I don't think we have enough I mean, the here. whole thing is they have to swap <laughs> persona yeah. one guy's button up and the other guy's kind of like wait, wait, you're getting that from this poster <laughs> one guy's button up and the other one's a little bit more loosey goosey <laughs> they have to switch personas and it, I remember being like that sounds so fucking funny with those two guys and the movie starts and you're like oh this is like bad company this is one of those movies that should be a comedy and is not and has no jokes and in of it. course written and directed by George Gallo of the comeback trail that's the thing the movie should be midnight run and instead you're like why is this like but I mean, every movie, like should, every dogs, movie should be Midnight Run. The thing about Midnight Run know, is, why aren't there more Midnight Run? Exactly. Why is it the only one? Why is nothing as good as Midnight and like, Run? And uh, like, I feel that way about You Can Count On Me and Midnight Run. Where I'm mm. like, we could have a lot of these. Yeah. And instead, they're so the exception, and that's, makes, that's confusing to me. Okay, I also just movies want tonight. to note that opening at number 11 is Sean Penn's excellent film, The Pledge, mm. uh, which was a, a disastrous bomb, but it's yeah. a good movie. Right. Mm. A lot, a lot, I've never seen it, but like that's considered maybe the best late period Nicholson performance. It's really good. He is it a, is it a Nicholson directing one or it's is that Penn just... directing Nicholson? Oh, Sean so Penn I, directs. At, is it and who directed the Crossing Guard? Sean Penn. So before that, before and yeah, that's also a good movie. Uh, Sean yeah. Penn made The Indian Runner. Yeah. Crossing Guard, The Pledge, Into the Wild, and it was like this guy is a pretty good director yeah. of mm-hmm. pretty good dramas like yep. that are very dark yes mm-hmm. really good with actors obviously and then um and ben stiller you know uh he remains a really chill dude who never did the last weird. face <laughs> <laughs> the last face and flag day okay those it's only those two are his more recent yeah yeah uh so he but just the, steadily keeps making films he not really like he made the last face and flag day recently but there was a long gap in between right. those and into especially the when into the wild had the like, last so face was like a goodwill. notorious like people at the Cannes film right. festival were like throwing tomatoes at right the like people were <laughs> type thing right. and it starred charlie's there and when they were dating and then it came out like two years after they broke up because it was like radioactive and then flag day is him and his real life daughter and he was like i want to make a movie about i've been a bad father and it came out right when theaters were reopening uh and bombed and then it was already being ignored he I was mean, doing a press tour despite having the sizzling title of flag day <laughs> right. but he was like going on every late night talk show with his daughter being like i made this movie about my daughter by the way men today are too weak <laughs> wearing dresses <laughs> he can't help they're too feminized <laughs> he did some crazy anti beta male oh. rant on like the view or whatever anyway is a gap because he was raising that daughter in between like it just why is there a gap at all I don't know. Why did he come back? I understand why he went away. He's an asshole. Yeah, but he's 
it, there's always, there's always no, a he reason. Should, he should make a lot more movies. I, I yeah. don't know why. I don't know why. If he, if he feels that strongly that he should be making movies, then I just don't understand why he stopped. I think he feels strongly about a lot of yeah, things. Yeah. I think the problem is he keeps He's on He's going to smelt his Oscar, remember? He's going to smelt it. Remember I'm so he fucking said he would waiting. smelt his Oscar if Zelensky didn't He smelt both of them. <laughs> right. He's going to smell my right. Oscars. Yeah. Uh, Can you imagine if yeah. Zelensky, if they had piped Zelensky into the Oscars after the slap and he had to just be like, um. <laughs> right. Everyone's just like, uh, okay, hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sure, sure, sure. Was yeah. that scripted? Do we think? Uh, <laughs> so, right. He actually just wants to talk. So about let's it. talk about the thing that you guys will now be talking. You guys will be talking right. more about the war than that, right? Right. My, my immediate thought after the slap was, thank God Zelensky isn't on this. Yeah, they had to save him for the Grammys. Right. It remains so insane that that happened at the Oscars and then they did the, the rest of the Oscars. Yep. And just Chastain got up there and was like, I like to thank. And I'm just like, she might as just like, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> yeah. like, I just like had no idea what she's saying. Yes. Just like watching a Twitter feed be like, what is going on? Like, it's the yeah, weirdest thing in the world. That be, yeah. Chaos. No one will. That will. That's exactly the movie, the kind of movie too, that not. That people will forget, maybe it will all be kind of lost. Everything will be lost. Yeah. What What did Jessica Chastain win her Oscar for? And also, what did she do during her speech? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it, the slap was so big that it not only eradicated the speech, but the films that the people were in were also erased. Right, right. Like it went <laughs> that far. Like the whole anything that they were <laughs> there's like weird ripples. <laughs> yeah. Coda is like, where's the little film that could? Ah! Yeah. Like, like it no longer exists as a film. <laughs> it is. It is funny. I was at Marie Barty Party Barty's mm -hmm. yes. uh, Oscar party along with Ben, and I was talking yes. to a lot of people at the party where I was like, I am so flummoxed by the fact that Coda has got this goodwill behind it because I think if you're looking for like the inspirational down the middle family overcoming the odds drama king richard is so much better than coda and then an hour later i was like king richard will never be watched by anyone ever again for the rest of time it's, it's, it's so gonna take strange. a while for that to, one to settle yes no but yeah. maybe never you're right like i was on the plane i just yeah. got back on the plane you it's on there it's in the queue yeah. king richard and you just like like it's like you hover your finger over it, almost like an experiment. I'm like, am I going to jump from the train? Like you like you you get chills at the idea. Look, of pressing. I like that movie a lot. I didn't. I mean, I'll never see it. I'm yet. like, I don't know if I'll ever watch it again. And beyond the fact that it's just like, oh, it's weird that that's the one he won for. The fact that he gets up and starts his speech with Richard Williams fought for his family. I'm like, movies ruined. It forever. does does hurt the movie inextricably. I think, I'll uh, say this. Yeah. I watched Focus last week. Have yeah. you ever seen Focus? It's yeah, leaving it's HBO kind Max. of fun. Good movie. Yeah, it's a fun movie. And guess what? Didn't feel too weird. I'm just King I'm Richard. Just like, I'm just is that a King Richard. King Richard's Richard the Smith one. It it's not. But King that's Richard's not. The one. But it's not about the. It's not. It's it's King. It's a very specific yes. thing. Richard. I, I don't I'm, disagree I mean, with you. I mean, I'm telling I don't you, disagree. it felt like if I had hit King Richard on the plane, I was gonna like set off something. Like I, yeah. it was like a truly potent feeling of being like this. Just isn't. I don't even. It's not even like. It's not even like I have like a com I have co a lot of feelings about the slap. Mm. It's not like. It's beyond anything that's like a yes or no yes, thing. It's yes. just, you don't watch this. This is never... This but, is but that having been said, David, you and I texted about just announced this week, 25th anniversary, Men in Black, 4K Steelbook. Yeah. I'm going to fucking Sonic the Hedgehog run over to that Best Buy locker to put it, pick it up and put it into my player. Yeah. It's not like I feel like Will Smith is forever tarnished. No, he's not the no. one who was detonated. It's it's that movie. King it's Richard's actually done. perfect. It actually like it. It's kind of tidy in that way. Yeah, just let's leave. It's like a sarcophagus, like around Chernobyl. It's, it's, like, like, well, it's like when you take the, the, it's like the, you take the, the bomb and you drop yeah, it in the ocean. It's, 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 it well, it's like under. the right. Green Goblin's one of his balls. Skellington. It yeah. turns it's a controlled little goblin. Yeah, that's All a call right. forward. I gotta pee. Okay, you gotta take us out. Okay. Yeah, we gotta we gotta wrap this up. Starly, thank you for being here. You're welcome. Is there anything you want to plug? I have a a a, po a podcast I wrote um, called Excessive with my friend Dan Roberts. Um, it'll be coming out at some point in the future. It's on Audible. Keep You're your gonna eyes be in open. it. Yeah, I'm gonna be in it. This yes. was negotiated. <laughs> yeah. Tense negotiations right before <laughs> this recording. Is some real time negotiations. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna be working on the show, Dave. Watch that. That is a show that I love. Great. That is an excellent show. Great. Uh, you're working on the third season? Third season. That's very cool. That is a show, I, I say this, I hope this doesn't come across backhanded at all, 
But I was like, there's no way I like that show. Yep. And then everyone was telling me the show's really fucking good. And then I watched it and I was like, holy shit, the show's really fucking good. I had the same experience. And then a year or two later, the second season comes out and people were like, holy shit, this is a huge leap from the first season. And I was like, hold your horses. Dave isn't going to take a huge leap from <laughs> season one to season two. I watched all season two. I was like, the fucking holy shit, huge leap. People describe it really accurately. It's got the most accurate word of mouth hype I would say yeah because it has to have it it feels impossible and the show is aware of it I think to its credit yeah oh yes. my god the balancing act of it it, yeah. it, it is incredibly good I'm very excited you're writing for that yeah. uh, you're, you're a phenomenal writer and the show is lucky to have you Thank as you. much as uh, uh, we are lucky to now get to be able to watch starly written episodes of Dave yeah there'll be starly written episodes of Dave his dick's really weird Ben yeah I know it's a big part of the show This is, and this is the last thing I'm doing before starting on day, sure. this is all I want. I cared about making time for in the world. We should say you literally got off an airplane, a, a red eye flight, yeah. and came straight to Ben's apartment to record a thing that is uh, bananas, but that you were very adamant to do. So adamant. Uh, I like in between. I, yeah. The last time you were on the show, I, I shot my tiny thing for the search party finale, and we spent a lot of time talking on set, and then Charles Rogers' birthday party, and you, you'd you been telling me how uh, into Blank Check you had gotten. Oh, uh, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i about to—so I drove from right. L.A. to New York last June 2021, pretty much only listened to Blank Check. I'm about to drive back to L.A. Blank Check's only—in fact, I was so—it's like— when I found I was going to be on it, I was glad that I was going to have a bit of a lead time because I was like, what if I don't have, I don't want to have my episode in there. Oh, sure. I need to have enough Sam Raimi to get me to LA. Sure. And sure. so then if I clog it up, I'm not, I, I lose an episode. But I, uh, I like now that this season I feel like is really when we're, it's the, the people you've asked back and we're really understanding like the scarcity of slots oh, and, sure. and hearing, I hear it in every Sam Raimi guest. We're, we're at this stage of the pandemic. We're here again. We're all together and we made it, uh, we made it through and we're back on the show. We're, tr we're, tr we're trying. It definitely, look, I certainly enjoy making the show a lot more than I did two years ago or even a year ago. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Yeah, but I just I just like that there's some like that some of the that the, the, you know the gang's all back. Like, we're, the, it, yes, it's, it's better. In yes, yeah, and it's nice to like oh I, I mean, someone I, like you who we knew but we had never gotten to record with in person. Uh, thank you for uh, coming straight from the airport to record this stupid podcast and not even taking a shower. A thing that boggles my mind. No, I mean there was no uh, there was no shower in between airport and. Oh, bed. I'm just. But saying. I wish I had. If I I wish, but then I'm like oh. The, the, Knowing that there's that Delta Lounge that exists and people do have the showers, in I, know, there. I don't have wild. that. Access. It's well, no, but yeah, no. I'm like that would be a reason to like, get those the miles in order to take a shower in order to be on the podcast freshly, medallion, fresh status. ready to go. But yeah, so I'm gonna do this and then I'll get dry in my car and just to start listening to Blink Check. Thank you again. Yeah, yeah. And thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media and helping put the show together in a bunch of other ways. Thank you to AJ McKee and Alex Barron for our editing, Lane Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song, Pat Reynolds and Joe Bowen for our artwork, JJ Birch for our research. You can go to blankcheckpod.com for links to all the nerdy shit connected to this show. And you can go to patreon.com slash blankcheck for Blank Check special features where we do commentaries on franchises twice a month, and we're doing all the Batman movies that we haven't done before. Filling in all those gaps before we get to Roger Moore, who won our March Madness. He did. David's excited. I'm excited for that. Yeah. Uh, I watched the Oscar speech where Moore, Connery, and Kane give out Best Supporting Actor to, I'm forgetting whom now, Kevin Klein. Hmm? Oh, he comes for, back. For Did he decline it? No, he accepted. Huh. Yeah, that one he didn't decline. He aclined. Um, <laughs> uh, tune in next week for a movie. I'm just going to check my notes here. That is called uh, Spider uh, Man. Cool. A 2002 Sam Raimi film called Spider Man uh, with guest Matt Singer of Screen Great Crush. Up. Not short. Not short. But we got a lot to talk about. The man who wrote, he would say a book on Spider Man, but I would say the book on Spider Man. Uh, and as always, he's a boxer, isn't it? He's a boxer, isn't he? He's a boxer, isn't he? Jubbly, jubbly. A boxer, jubbly. <laughs>